Right, good morning, Steve. Welcome everyone. My name is Steve Hawkins and I am the executive director of the Marijuana Policy Project. I'm excited to be bringing to you all today our Zoom event entitled Reimagining Justice, where we will look at the intersection of cannabis, race, and policing in the United States. We have an awesome and truly great group of panelists today who will bring you their knowledge, their expertise, and their wisdom as we explore several topics. We will touch upon the history of cannabis criminalization in the United States and how that has helped to define the role of policing. We will also look at how cannabis has been weaponized uh, in how police go about painting and portraying victims of police violence. And we'll also look at how we can focus on, on, on remedies and changing the uh, discourse through legalization and through release and dealing with collateral consequences. So we have an exciting lineup today and I wanna start by giving the opportunity to my good friend, Derek Johnson, who is president and CEO of the NAACP. Let, let me say a bit about the NAACP. The NAACP has been at the forefront for years now in looking at issues of race and criminal justice. And as a national organization, it certainly understands the intersection of the war on drugs 
and racial disparities in our criminal justice system. And without further ado, it's my great honor and distinct privilege to bring to you Derek Johnson to offer opening remarks. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Steve. I wanna thank uh, your team for pulling together this important virtual conversation. Uh, cannabis, as is now being called, marijuana, as some people call, but weed in my neighborhood, as we call it, has been a big issue for decades. Uh, like many of you who may have come from families who've participated in the commerce of, of, of weed for many years, uh, it is ironic to say the least, as we see the progression of public policy in this nation. My neighborhood in Detroit, I know of many people who have gotten uh, criminal records as a result of their participation in the economy of, of cannabis. And as a result of that, they have been unable to clearly navigate in society because of criminal records. And now that we are, we are decriminalizing uh, cannabis in so many states, the real question that's confronting us is how are we gonna make whole uh, the many individuals across the country who have been negatively impacted because of the criminalization of cannabis? Uh, in addition to that, how are we gonna open up participation for so many African-Americans who have, as a, as a result of limited access, uh, dependent on this economy for their family survival? These are important questions. As the NAACP, we recognized clearly that mass incarceration was a way to contain and stunt the growth of African-Americans. We also understand very clearly that the ability to navigate in this economy, both as workers, but most importantly as entrepreneurs, should be paramount to our mission and our focus. And with this emerging market, uh, we need to continue to advocate to open it up for African-Americans to participate, address the harms of past uh, uh, legal barriers and the criminalization of this uh, uh, industry. Uh, but most importantly, make sure that as we move forward as an organization, as a community, as a collection of social justice advocates, we do all we can to ensure there is equity and access for this industry. I wish a successful dialogue for this conference. I'll be listening in as we partner with you, Steve, and all of your participants to, to further this dialogue. Thank you all very much. Derek, thank you so much. It was great to hear from Derek Johnson and to start off our conference and MPP enjoys a great partnership with the NAACP and I know it will only grow under Derek's leadership. Folks, I want to call your attention to our hashtag for today which is reimagining justice. And please elevate the conversation through social media throughout the course of the event today. Um, please share our link um, on Facebook Live and on YouTube um, and send that out and post throughout the conversation so that we can spread the word and keep this important conversation going. I want to now turn to a man who really needs no introduction and has become a a uh, well-known face in many households over the years, and that is Roland Martin. Roland Martin is a respected journalist who has been at the forefront of so many issues confronting the African-American community throughout the course of his career. Roland has a podcast and show uh, entitled Roland Martin Unfiltered, which I encourage all of you to check out, and he um, has a weekly, I believe, uh, series on cannabis justice uh, that, that appears on, on his program. So it is my distinct pleasure to bring to you all Roland Martin, who will say a few words and open up the first panel today. Thank you. All right, folks, certainly glad to have all of you here. Glad uh, to have this conversation. Um, this is an issue. Uh, that I have covered for uh, any number of years, uh, not only when you well, not only when you talk about uh, African Americans who have been impacted on the criminal justice side, but how we have individuals who are still is sitting in prison uh, as a result of marijuana laws, and how the war on drugs has specifically targeted African Americans. Uh, 
But what we have to understand, this is also an economic issue, as Derek points out. Uh, we see what is happening all across this country, and I made perfectly clear uh, that we cannot have an explosion of the cannabis industry, publicly traded companies. You have people like former Speaker of the House John Boehner, who was an ardent opponent uh, of uh, of um, um, these, uh, of course, de decriminalizing marijuana, who now all of a sudden uh, is working uh, on behalf, benefiting financially. African Americans must also be owners, be owners. Now, again, laws were targeted to black folks who were selling marijuana when it was deemed illegal. Now, all of a sudden, uh, it is becoming illegal in many places and African-Americans are being shut out of the process. I've talked to people in, in Illinois, folks in Maryland, folks in California talking about these issues. And the reality is we must uh, be there. Let me also be perfectly clear. This is also an issue that we still must confront when it comes to companies that target young African-Americans uh, in terms of being smokers, vaping, things along those lines. And so we must also uh, be vocal when it comes to uh, the targeting and the marketing of African-Americans. And again, what is our participation? And so I I'm going to continue to cover those issues. And so if there are critics of this event, fine create your own event to have the conversation, invite the same people, and we'll have the same dialogue. But shutting down communication does not solve anything. Actually having more discussion does. It's time to introduce our panel. Uh, first up, Neil Franklin. He currently serves as Executive Director of Law Enforcement Action Partnership. Uh, he's a 34-year veteran of the Maryland State Police and the Baltimore Police Department, where he oversaw 17 separate drug task forces. forces. Nakichi uh, uh, Taifa currently serves as the executive director for the Justice Roundtable. The Justice Roundtable is a broad-based coalition of more than 100 organizations working to reform federal criminal justice laws and policies. Uh, Natalie Capillion is the founder and executive director of the Equity Organization, a non a not-for-profit working to advance just, effective, and equitable criminal justice and drug policy reforms. Last but certainly not least, not sure if he is actually on here, uh, Pastor Jamal Bryant, Senior Pastor, New Birth Missionary Baptist Church uh, in Lithonia, Georgia. He has been an advocate for the legalization of cannabis as a social and economic empowerment measure for communities of color. So glad to have everybody here for panel one. Natalie, I want to start with you. A lot of people really don't understand uh, the history here uh, of uh, America's drug laws. Uh, if people look at documentaries like the one done by um, uh, Ava DuVernay uh, uh, dealing with the 13th Amendment, which is available on Netflix, when they think about uh, uh, Jarecki's documentary uh, again. So give folks an understanding of how drug laws in America are directly tied to white supremacy. Thank you for that, uh, Roland, and thank you, MPP and Steve, for bringing together this uh, incredible event. I think we're going to have a wonderful dialogue around all of these issues. And, you know, I think we're all, or most of us who are on this um, panel today, are very well aware of the fact that the enforcement of our policies, and more specifically our cannabis policies, has been prejudicial. We have tons of data and insights to back that up. And I think most people in America and across the world are, are familiar with the fact that the war on drugs and specifically the war on cannabis has been a complete and utter failure, at, at least in some aspects. But I think one of the things that's often missing from the conversation, and I tend to focus on in my work, is that in a lot of ways, the war on cannabis was and continues to be incredibly successful because you know, both in its inception and its enforcement, it's really been a war on people and it's been a war on uh, black people and brown people specifically. And so while the dialogue tends to start around 1971, um, the Nixon administration and the formal declaration of um, the war on drugs, the sort of sordid history of the criminalization of cannabis and its sort of racist and xenophobic origins begins much earlier than that. And I wanna to stress to everyone in attendance, cannabis, marijuana, whatever you wanna call it, has been part and parcel of American history since its inception. Um, you know, colonial governments required settlers to, to cultivate hemp for industrial purposes. 
starting in the early 1800s, cannabis and, and marijuana-based medicines were prescribed by doctors, produced by companies that would become, you know, big uh, pharmaceutical giants like uh, uh, Brayer Squibs and, and companies like that. But because of marijuana or cannabis association with Black populations, especially in the South, so I'm going to take us back really quickly. It's the early 20th century. We're seeing the increasing enfranchisement of Black Americans, given um, sort of the repercussions of the Civil War. You're starting to gain a little bit more political power and economic power. Um, African Americans are migrating to southern port cities where they are mm -hmm. introduced to cannabis by former um, former slaves, a lot of Mexican immigrants into the Southwest, as well as Caribbean sailors. They are um, using they are using this substance for social reasons because, to be totally frank, it was more accessible and cheaper than alcohol. This is the era of American alcohol prohibition, so that's just the context. And one of the things that comes out of this mo movement that we're all very familiar with is jazz and jazz culture. And for those who don't know, there's a pretty tight relationship between jazz culture and sort of cannabis usage. Louis Armstrong arrested for possessing marijuana. He had a whole sort of subculture around its consumption. Um, it was thought to be a, a less harmful and more enjoyable sort of social activity than, than alcohol, which was the preeminent uh, social activity of the time. And as this association with jazz sort of rises up in the 20s and 30s, um, there tends to be a lot of fear coming from the sort of Anglo-American power structure that be around the increasing enfranchisement of Black Americans. We're seeing mixed race music venues. We're seeing, um, you know, more enlightened views around uh, the integration of society. We're seeing people start to criticize this racial racial caste system that we had set up. And the easiest thing for people in power to do was to sort of demonize the people who were thought to be encroaching on this sort of societal structure. And those were Black people, specifically entertainers. And so we see, you know, this was multiple people were, were part of the early criminalization, but there's one name that I'm sure a lot of us have heard of, Harry Anslinger. And he was an avowed racist. I want to be very clear about that. He was censored on the congressional floor several times for using racial slurs. And he was formerly in a prohibition officer and realized that with the end of alcohol prohibition, he needed a job. And he turned to marijuana with its association with sort of black Americans and, and Latinx Americans as sort of the new thing he was gonna police to criminalize and brutalize uh, you know, minority populations. And he was very, very, strategic around this and very, very devious around this. He threw out any, you know, the American Medical Association recommended not criminalizing cannabis. He threw that out and sort of disparaged those leaders. He went on the floor with testimony that was um, totally fabricated uh, around, you know, marijuana's impact on inciting violent crime and, and specifically um, interracial relationships and um, the rapes of white women. And he um, was so unvarnished in his explicit attempt to uh, associate Black Americans with cannabis usage and, and, and demonize them for that reason. He would say things on the floor of Congress, you know, reefer makes darkies think they're as good as white men. The primary reason to outlaw marijuana is its effect on the degenerate races. He, um, you know, called jazz satanic music that was associated with Negroes and um, caused by marijuana usage. And we see, as we'll talk about later in the panel, how that spirals and, um, you know, lays the foundation for the first piece of right. federal legislation. So that's the early history. And I think it's great to, to ground us in that. And, and, and the reason all of that is important, because I think, again, the folks really don't understand. And I, I purposely use the phrase white supremacy, Neo, uh, because it was to target black folks. It was to uh, to target them. Uh, Neil, when you think about uh, various police actions, uh, when we talk about uh, when, when you look at uh, the, when you look at drugs there, when you look at even when you talk about uh, cocaine, powder cocaine versus crack, when you look at uh, how the arrest patterns, when you look at who people are targeting, uh, when people were talking about stop and frisk in New York. Uh, and I said, if you want to deal with actually drugs in New York, go to Wall Street. You can actually stop and frisk a bunch of people uh, to find drugs. This is how 
this nation has targeted and how mass incarceration increased by specifically targeting African-Americans and unleashing uh, law enforcement against communities of color, specifically black folks. Uh, was that for me, Roland? Neil, yeah. Neil, go ahead. Okay, so yeah, this is uh, from a law enforcement perspective. Um, I mean, you hit the nail right on the head. We do not have an equal enforcement opportunity out there for all of us when it comes to our drug laws. All right. So as 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 we just heard, historically, uh, it was based. These drug laws are based upon race and culture, and today we're still dealing with it. Now, specifically talking about marijuana. We've made some advances in this country. We have a number of states that have adult use markets. We have medical marijuana throughout many of the states. We have de decriminalized marijuana in a number of states across this country. And even with all of that, we're still making hundreds of thousands of arrests every year for marijuana possession alone. And most of those people by far are people of color, black folks. So, if we want to, and, and, and right now we're, we're at a time dealing with police reform on the murder of, of George Floyd and the many people who have come before, who have passed before George Floyd at the hands of the police, we're now at this, this pivotal moment, this window of opportunity for dramatic police reform. But I'm gonna tell you something, it cannot happen. Meaningful police reform cannot happen as long as we have marijuana prohibition in this country. So we have to end it from coast to coast. Most of the searches that we experience today in law enforcement are the result of marijuana, right? So the street corner searches that police are, 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 are doing on our citizens, the, the car stops, it is because of the odor of marijuana that the police are walking up to people, stopping cars, sm smelling or saying they smell marijuana and then conducting searches. I'm in Baltimore, Maryland, and we are still on the heels of a Department of Justice investigation where we had unconstitutional policing at the Yin Yang here in Baltimore. Um, hundreds of thousands of people were being stopped in the streets of Baltimore and searched unconstitutionally. And the primary reason for that was looking for marijuana. And I'll, and I'll end right here with something. We had police chiefs across this country from Philadelphia to Chicago to Baltimore, saying that we are having street violence because of these corner marijuana sales, people selling marijuana on street corners. Well, this is the opportunity right here and now to get it off of the street corners, to get it into a business or an establishment, you know, because when that happens, we don't have shootings from, from one store owner to the other. We don't have Cores and Anheuser of Bush fighting it out in our street corners, per se. But when we do that, as was said earlier, we need equity as we go forward in the business area, not just people being able to be employed, at, you know, uh, in in a grow facility or a dispensary. We need ownership opportunity. Black folks have caught the brunt of these failed racist policies, and going forward. They need to be at the front of this train with opportunities to own these businesses uh, and to employ people in these businesses. And for those who have been arrested and incarcerated, their records need to be cleared and not at their expense. It needs to be done for free. So I'll pause right there. But again, from a law enforcement perspective and moving forward with police reform, this must be done for us to have meaningful police reform and, and reduce the, the number of police citizen contacts within our cities and towns across this country. All right, then, certainly appreciate it. Uh, we're joined by Pastor Jamal Bryant, so certainly glad to have him here. I'm going to go to him in just a second. Uh, Nakechi, again, the pr people sitting out there we talk about this oftentimes on a federal level, but federal prisoners only represent 10% of all the people who are in jail. This is really, these marijuana laws really have been used locally. You've seen Kim Fox in um, Chicago. You've seen Marilyn Mosby in Baltimore. 
you've seen local DAs, Larry Krasner in Philadelphia, of course, uh, vacate a lot of these convictions. And so explain to people why we must be targeting local DAs when it comes to prosecuting these cases, uh, when it comes to, uh, again, um, freeing people who have been targeted via marijuana laws. This is a local thing, not really what's happening in D.C. or state capitals. Well, actually, um, Roland, the local jurisdictions take their um, imprimatur from what's going on uh, federally. That's one of the problems. I just must say that nothing, nothing, nothing more has contributed to the systematic incarceration, the mass incarceration of Black people and communities of color across the country has been none other than the war on drugs. Uh, the Black community has experienced over three decades of misguided, knee-jerk policy decisions mandated as part of the flawed war on drugs, all of which has had a negative impact on race. And cannabis criminalization in particular has wrought uh, travesties, particularly on communities that are over-policed and has contributed to this unprecedented rate of um, incarceration. Natalie talked earlier about the early uh, history, but I just wanna say that, you know, in the late 60s and early 70s, when Richard Nixon declared this war on drugs, leading policymakers on the state level, on the local level, as well as on the federal level to legislate harsh penalties, criminal penalties for drug uh, offenses, black people were disproportionately again victimized by these draconian policies. And that declaration by Nixon was intentional. We didn't find out till decades later. Uh, specifically, the Nixon White House had two enemies. They had two enemies, specifically the, um, uh, the anti-war um, hippies that he called them and black people. And basically we find out that what was said was that if we associate the anti-war and black people with marijuana and with heroin and what heroin, what we can do is criminalize these communities. We can disrupt them, we can arrest them, we can break up the meetings and we can vilify them night after night on the, um, uh, you know, on the nightly news. And basically what said was, and I'm quoting, did we know that we were wrong, that we were lying? Did we know that we were lying about the drugs? And the answer was, of course we did. We didn't know it back then, but we know it now. And then moving up to the um, 94 crime bill, what I call the granddaddy of all crime bills. I've been involved in policy on criminal justice issues for over 30 years. I walked the halls of Congress fighting against these omnibus um, uh, uh, crime bill. But that crime bill in 94 featured the largest expansion of the death penalty in modern times, the gutting of paper corpus, the evisceration of the exclusionary rule, the, 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 the um, cutting out of Pell educational grants, the, um, of the trying of 13 year olds as adults, the refusal to address the crack powder disparity and more and more money given to more and more states to lock up more and more people for longer periods um, of time. So unquestionably, the drug war buttressed by these policies on the federal and on the local and on the state level has, uh, has been the direct driver of uh, mass incarceration, which has led to the racial disparities. And I just want to conclude by saying that um, we're talking about out of 1.5 million drug arrests in the United States in 2016, 80%, 80% were for possession only with a vast number of arrests uh, uh, and resources spent focused on marijuana offenses. This has got to change. Pastor Jamal Bryant, the reality is that um, faith leaders have played a huge role in this in terms of pastors standing in pulpits decrying drug use, alcohol use, calling it evil, calling it something uh, that's devilish, things along those lines. But as Paul Harvey said, now the rest of the story. Uh, when, you, when you think about uh, what has been said in pulpits, not just black preachers, but uh, whites and others, is that there's a flip side to that demonization of drug use, and it was uh, the, it, it was these drug laws. Now people are seeing uh, the result of that demonization and and throwing folks in prison, as opposed to 
advocating for treatment, things along those lines. And so what role does the faith community play when it comes to confronting uh, these laws, confronting how they have been used to specifically target African-Americans, which has a direct impact on black folks being able to get jobs, being in the criminal justice system, being able to own homes, being able to go to go to school. I mean, this has has had a devastating impact on black communities, which is the other stuff these preachers often had talked about. I, I think, uh, Roland, first, uh, good afternoon to uh, you and uh, all of uh, our panelists. I am uh, uh, here in Atlanta, but I am from uh, Baltimore uh, with Neil, uh, which is really one of the epicenters uh, of the drug movement, hence uh, the wire and the corner. And I believe, uh, regrettably, that uh, the Black church has blood dripping from its hands. Uh, because not only have we uh, criminalized it, uh, but we made it a moral issue. And in making it a moral issue, we don't even understand how it is that we played into the narrative uh, that Natalie talked about uh, just a few moments ago. I pastor a role in the um, largest land-owning Black church in America uh, with uh, some 300-plus acres. Uh, and upon uh, getting here, I realized that we're really going to do uh, economic development uh, and do something for uh, our young people. Uh, why not uh, the Black church lead the way uh, in rebranding or repackaging uh, cannabis into uh, the Black community uh, by one, doing farming, uh, not just in distribution, but also in production. Uh, you would be amazed uh, how the saints uh, almost went into cardiac arrest just at the notion of introducing the idea. Uh, but I think that the church can't just be uh, the funeral headquarters uh, in the drug movement, uh, but it's really got to be a place of life and uh, relearning. Uh, and so I, I uh, remember, Roland, four years ago when I was pastoring at uh, Empowerment Temple in Baltimore, I uh, hosted uh, the state's largest gun buyback program. I uh, hosted it and uh, it went to a place I would have never fathomed or imagined. Uh, the, the weaponry that they came in with, Neil was so dizzying that the police said, we gotta leave uh, because we can't even be here on the grounds because some of these weapons are military grade and we don't even know how they're on the streets. So they were coming in with night scopes and. Uh, everything else. And uh, we had a line wrapped around the church and uh, we were getting ready to close and a black suburban came pulled up and uh, they popped open the trunk and there was just guns everywhere. I looked at the committee, I said, Lord, we ain't got enough money for this. Uh, <laughs> so I said, you all got to go down the Harbor Bank, the black owned bank in Baltimore. Y'all got to go get a withdrawal in order for me to uh, pay these guys for all these weapons we're getting off the street. And Roland, they convicted me. Uh, they said to me, Pastor, we don't need your hundred dollars. We wanna know, can you get us a job? Uh, and I realized that the church had failed uh, because um, uh, we have really been putting a Band-Aid on an open heart surgery issue. Uh, the very first protest I ever went to as a kid is when my dad uh, took me to Washington to protest uh, against uh, Ronald Reagan uh, chanting for jobs and justice. Uh, and that's what uh, young people are crying for in Baltimore, Detroit, in Atlanta, uh, and regrettably from Colorado to Baltimore, you can't even get in the game if you got a felony on your record. Uh, and this model for marijuana than black males. We know how to do it with no MBA in tow. Uh, and so I think that we've got to really, the church is gonna have to really uh, look at uh, how it is that we have approached it, how we have vilified our sons who have been a part of the process, the overwhelming majority of whom behind bars are nonviolent offenders. Uh, and so I uh, really am waving the flag not uh, to surrender uh, but to say, put us in, coach. Uh, let the church be a part of the dialogue and the conversation, uh, because Benjamin May says, if you don't run faster, you're forever going to be left behind. And so I'm hoping that the Black church can be a part of the conversation and the process. 
this issue has, has, has multiple tentacles to it. And this is anyone from the panel can jump in on this because you have, you, you, we can't look at this conversation solely from the perspective of just decriminalization and then legalization. We have to also look at uh, the concerns that people raise when it comes to young African-Americans being targeted, uh, just like we did when it came to uh, big tobacco. And so, and now, now you start talking about, well, African-Americans owning, then you talk about using, you still have a reality out there when it comes to folks having to have jobs and still being drug tested. Uh, and so you're dealing with uh, athletes who talk about, uh, you got you got um, medicinal marijuana. You got athletes are talking about the ability to use it because they don't want to be addicted to opioids, uh, and so it helps them with that as well. And so, um, how must how, how should we be approaching this in a holistic way as opposed to having uh, folks only look at just this piece in this piece? This is really a much more broader issue than people really realize. And anybody can jump in first. Well, I'll just say it definitely needs to be looked at holistically. We didn't get where we are today piecemeal. We got to it with one part and then one part and then it all came, come, came together. And I just have got to say that all of it stems from, in my humble opinion, unanswered questions since the end of the Civil War, unanswered questions from uh, the enslavement era, from uh, the black codes, from uh, uh, the, the sharecropping, from the peonage system, from uh, you know, all the way down to the redlining and gerrymandering, the drug war and the mass incarceration, it's all interconnected. And until we start looking at it as a comprehensive whole, we won't be able to abate it. We can't just say, um, okay, well now we have this huge marijuana, this huge cannabis industry and put completely forget about the scores and the hundreds and the thousands and millions of people disproportionately black who were caught up in uh, that system, who spent time and now have felony convictions and cannot bail themselves now of the benefits of the mass um, um, uh, profits to be made uh, from it. It's all interrelated. You can't just say, um, uh, okay, so we're going to let you out, but then not deal with the, uh, the impact of incarceration and the continuing collateral consequences, which again, knocks people out of primarily disproportionately black people out of being able to um, benefit from this industry that was now. And, 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 and to that point, and to that point, individuals who were in, in jail for marijuana laws are being barred from actually participating where it's legal. What the hell? That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yes. Right. So there's a, as you said, there are many moving pieces to this. Right now you're talking about the restoration piece, restoration of lives, which is the restoration of communities as well, families and communities, um, restoring the records and not just restoring the records, um, but as you're saying, giving them opportunities to become part of this industry going forward for that economic equity. Now, there are many pieces of legislation that are being prepared, that have been prepared at the state, local and federal levels. Uh, and we need to ensure, there are many organizations out there involved in this work, but collectively, as a community, a black community, we need to ensure that those pieces of policy at all these different levels of government make way for that. If it's a piece of policy that's been crafted and it doesn't permit the restoring, of, if it doesn't require the free restoring of these records, you need to turn it down. If, it, if, if, if the fees and the cost for getting into owning a business, as Dr. Brian, as you said, the cultivating piece of it, the processing piece of it, those are the two most uh, lucrative parts of the business, not the dispensaries, but the processing and the growing. If these pieces of policy uh, require too much money to participate and in a way unjustly and un, uh, unequally uh, distribute those opportunities, you need to turn it down. If the tax part of these uh, pieces of legislation do not provide funding, does not return funding, the taxes that are taken off of the sales, if it doesn't redirect those funds into the community, communities that have been devastated, the black communities that have been devastated by these racist policies that Natalie spoke about, you need to turn it down. 
And I'm not just talking about a piece of these funds, I'm talking about a significant portion of these funds. And we don't need these tax dollars going into policing, as we're seeing with many pieces of this policy. There's much more, but I just wanted to say that there are many moving pieces to this. And we have to make sure that in every one of these pieces, that Black folks are being taken care of and that the benefits or, or the opportunities are, are clearly there for them. And Natalie, the e economics, 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 jobs, jobs, jobs. Look, I keep telling everybody, everything in America comes down to money. When you think about these drug laws, how they were targeting black people, you have, you have, you saw it in Ferguson and all those counties surrounding St. Louis, where those, where those places, where those, those municipalities uh, were reaping millions from slapping uh, fines and, 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 and a different um, enforcement on black folks. We've seen, we've seen it all across the country. Uh, we, we've seen how we have been the economic engine for others, as opposed to being able to benefit um, how can we ensure that black people are not what I call uh, leg uh, m m uh, cannabis legalization sharecroppers where companies use us and use black caucuses in places uh, to legalize marijuana, marijuana while locking black people out of the other end, the financial end of this? That's a really great point. And one of the, you know, there are several just tactical things. We cannot have provisions that bar people who have um, low level, nonviolent marijuana related charges for participating in the industry. First of all, that's blatantly discriminatory and it just makes no sense. Why lock out people who have the experience and who have the interest in entering this industry for a purely sort of political play? I think we also need to make sure that the funds are there to sort of Neil's point. Right now it's prohibitively expensive to enter the industry. If basically, if you don't have a trust fund or know a lot of people with a trust fund, it's pretty much impossible to get in the game. That's not fair. Um, that's not sustainable. And that's only, you know, allocating the financial benefits to the people who in many cases actually profited from the criminalization. I think we also need to make sure that we are taking a public health focused approach. I think the criminalization of drugs more broadly has been painted as a public health policy. The data, the history, the testimonial is, is there. That was never the case, but we need to make sure as we're um, growing this legal industry, we're doing it in a responsible way because we also know the other side of the coin. A lot of times if an industry is allowed to grow unchecked and irresponsibly, that also has a disproportionate um, negative impact in communities of color in black communities specifically. So we need to make sure we're investing in research, we're investing in economic development, we're investing in the science. We know a gateway drug theory is wrong and it was propaganda to be totally fair. But we also need to make sure we're not um, you know, over indexing or, or doing a 180 and not accounting for how there are problematic practices, especially when you think about big industry that will um, disproportionately impact black communities as well. So we need to take that holistic look. Um, well, uh, may, may yeah, I, go ahead. May I, if I may, just because I just wanna make sure that the audience at large really understands a specific point it must be understood that uh, marijuana use is equally distributed among all groups and all social strata, whether we're talking about whites, blacks, Hispanics, mm -hmm. the, poor, the poor, all use marijuana at essentially the same rate. However, it is the enforcement of the marijuana laws that is not equally distributed. Instead, you have people of color and the poor, disproportionately black folk, who are much more likely to be arrested for simple marijuana offenses. What are we talking about? Let's name a few. The illegal police arrest quotas. I know Neil knows all about that. Stop and frisk tactics, pretextual traffic stops. He talked about the odor, you know, the pretext traffic stop. No knock raids, okay. Uh, the increased militarization of law enforcement. We just talked about that. Keep going, all keep this going. Racially dis discriminatory um, arrest. So I just went, oh, excuse me. That's coupled with um, fettered police discretion you know, where they make the decision at the lowest limb who, who they're going to stop and who they're going to um, target. So I just wanted to... Kichi, and, and, and also, this brings Neil, more Neil, money ahead. into Neil, go policing. Ahead. This brings more money into policing than most people realize. Civil forfeiture. Civil as the, forfeiture. Civil forfeiture where police departments are taking money from people on a daily basis all across this country, not arresting them, not charging them with crimes. The number one tool for doing that, as you said, Nikichi, the odor 
of marijuana it gets me into your pockets, it gets me into your cars, it gets me into your homes to take whatever I think might be tied to the illicit drug trade, selling marijuana or anything else. And I don't have to explain myself for doing it because it's a civil process. So that's an incentive for policing. And, and one of the, the uh, listeners had a question about what needs to happen for law enforcement to support what we're talking about here. Number one, we need to stop them from receiving so much money for it, right? All the grants that are available, the, the burn grants and other grants for enforcing drug laws, that needs to be, be, be halted along with civil forfeiture. Canada, Canada law enforcement has been supporting what we're talking about here for a while now, and they just came out publicly to support the decriminalization of all drugs. They're way ahead of us when it comes to cannabis. You mm -hmm. know, they, they've already crossed that bridge. So we need to learn from them in the law enforcement community and embrace what we're talking about here so that we can, you know, reestablish. Well, I don't even say reestablish, but establish, begin to establish a relationship between police and community. Jamal, um, this, is, this is important as well. You talked about the economic piece. And... I'm going to go back to this point about being sharecroppers. And let me be real clear, because, I, look, I don't owe anybody. My show is called Roman Mark Unfiltered for a reason. We also must be making it perfectly clear. Individual organizations and companies uh, that are out there campaigning for the legalization of marijuana, we want to know where are your black board members? Who are your black senior executives? Who are your black junior executives? Who are the black companies that you're doing business with on minority supplier development? Uh, don't don't we want to know what relationships do you have with historically black, black colleges and universities? If you're talking about uh, on the agriculture side, are you aligning with Prairie View a and University and Florida a and University? Are you aligning with those black land grant universities? And so that includes the sponsors of this Zoom right here. We cannot have a situation where other folks are earning billions on the backs of black people in this whole legalization effort. We, the, the, the reckoning is upon us and we must be challenging everyone to say, are you advertising with black owned media companies? Are you only going to uh, white owned media companies? That's what we should be saying, Pastor Brian. Uh, we have uh, noted um the BBC said last week that the George Floyd movement is the largest civil rights movement in 50 years. Mm -hmm. Dr. King, before he was killed, uh, said that the next progressive step after civil rights is civil rights. One of the striking observations that we saw from Minneapolis to Houston to Atlanta to LA is that this has been the largest multicultural demonstration we've ever seen. The Where the rubber meets the road, Mark Rowland, is, is this symbolic support or substantive support? Uh, because a whole lot of people are in line for mercy, but not in line for justice. Uh, and so I think that we've got a call on it. And I think that's part of the rallying cry of the church uh, is to really hold their feet to the fire. Uh, we know uh, after Operation Breadbasket is that that's where Reverend Jackson cut his teeth and mm -hmm. making sure that corporations uh, were accountable uh, and not just doing lip service by putting black people on commercials, but making sure that black people were on the boards. And I think uh, that we've got to do that. Um, when we look at NASCAR pulling down the uh, Confederate flag voluntarily, uh, it's a feel good moment. But after that, where are they going to invest? Uh, the Washington is now getting ready to change its name. What are you going to do? Um, Aunt Jemima and Miss Buttersworth are now on the missing people's report at the post offices. Now that we've taken them off the box, who can we take off the box at home? Uh, and so I think that we've got to really hold some accountability to this Wall Street initiative uh, to say that you can expect black people who are the nation's lead consumers to not have a seat at the table. And so I, I'm just really uh, rolling. I don't even know if that was a question. I'm your amen corner to say <laughs> that that's absolutely correct. And I, I think that that's one of the entrance points of the church is to be agitators. You taught me and, so that uh, at, the, at the end of the protest, uh, you had to have told me this 15 years ago, what's the ask? 
And if there right. is no heirs, <laughs> then stay at home. I, and I think that that's got to be part of the rallying cry. Absolutely. And so, Nakachi, I mean, that's, that's the thing here, that, that when we talk about this issue, you have social justice warriors out there, people who have, who have been getting arrested. Folks have been in the trenches uh, for 20 and 30 years trying to get these laws changed. You have had black law enforcement officers trying to get these laws changed, policy people as well. And we're seeing this. But now what we're seeing is not just uh, the battle when it comes to decriminalization. Now, when you begin to talk about legal now you get folk uh, who are supportive of it, who get real quiet when black folks start talking about where's our cut in terms of are you funding companies? Are you creating billion dollars? Let me be real clear to the cannabis industry. Are you creating multiple billion dollar funds that African-Americans can actually tap to be able to create companies that they could actually build and create scale. See, I'm not, I'm just not getting caught up in nice events. I want to know, are you going to put your money where your mouth is and where black folks benefit financially and not just large corporations? Now catch you in that way. Yeah. So, um, Roland, thank you for bringing all of that up. Cause I want to harken back to the first word you said when you first started the moderation, which was right, white, excuse me, which was white uh, supremacy, even though there might've been loosening of state uh, marijuana laws that have resulted in lower arrest rates across all racial groups. It is still black people who are yep. more likely than others to be arrested for marijuana law violations. We need to really look at the issue of race because that's where it's centered on. And we have to be very creative. In Evanston, Illinois, just recently, an, or the, the, they passed a, 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 a bill to take the tax revenue from their legal cannabis industry and use a portion of that tax revenue to fund repertory justice projects in uh, um, um, the city of Evanston, Illinois, in communities specifically right. that have been hard hit by redlining and things along those lines. That's the type of creativity that we need in addition to diversifying the industry and making sure that the records are expunged and all like that. We really need to look towards issues dealing with repertory justice. And, but but Manali, to the point that uh, Reverend uh, Pastor Brian talked about, uh, if you had individuals out there who had guns and who have been selling drugs because they have lack of access uh, to quality jobs, now to Nikechi's point, I'm look. I mean, I got the story right here. Uh, Illinois weed tax hall. $52 million. Somebody is making that money at $52 million. Now you're talking about with legalization, you can create economic opportunities for individuals. My point is black folks have to be owning that all of a sudden you begin to employ. Now you begin to change economic uh, situations that's legal as opposed to before what was illegal. Yeah. I mean, I think we need to be making sure those tax revenues are going to entrepreneurs who, uh, black entrepreneurs who want to start businesses in this space. I think we also need to be really frank. Not everyone wants or should be in the business, but their communities, whether they've been directly harmed or whether it's their neighbor or their mom or their dad, they've been suffering. And so that money also needs to go to the community and be invested in things that are not just cannabis related. We need youth centers, we need um, investment in public education in, in these communities. And so we can be creative about how we spread that money out. We also need to realize the devil is in the details. We can create as many social equity programs as you want, but if the industry is rigged, if there are things like prohibitively, reg you know, uh, difficult zoning regulations, if the sort of local school board can get involved, there are things that don't feel impactful and we know the big industry players are lobbying for because it lends itself to a monopolistic uh, sort of economic landscape. And so we need to be talking about the tax revenue, we need to be talking about the regulations governing the legal industry because the, de the devil's in the details and that makes it even more difficult for people who are not incredibly well resourced or connected to sort of even begin to think about applying for a legal license. 
Got a couple of questions here. The question, how does the subject of reparations connect with this topic of cannabis justice? How can cannabis consumers play a role in reimagining cannabis justice? Naketcha, you actually answered that. Uh, you can expound on that when you said uh, what, what's happening in Everson, Illinois. I actually had that city council member on who talked, who connected, um, who connected their proceeds from uh, the sale of weed and marijuana in Illinois to uh, reparations. We'll go right ahead. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. As far as I'm concerned, everything leads back to reparations and reparatory justice because it, it never um, happened and occurred. And I think that there's a, um, a direct connection to everything that we are confronted with today. I think Evanston can be looked at as a blueprint and actually it is being looked at as a blue blueprint for other jurisdictions across uh, the country. There, um, I'm, I'm uh, North Carolina is looking at things. Uh, Seattle, Washington is looking at things. There, there are uh, really about 200 different jurisdictions out there who are looking at ways to um, uh, um, to deal with this whole issue of reparations and to do it very concretely in 21st century uh, wise. And I think that this is um, one key uh, example in which it can happen and occur. Um, let's see, anyone else, especially on that, how can cannabis consumers play a role in reimagining can cannabis justice? Well, I black, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I was like, going to say it's about yeah. where you spend your money, right? Exactly. Do you know, vote with your dollar. There are, you know, there are not enough for the reasons we've outlined, but there are black operators and entrepreneurs who exist and will continue to exist. Support them. That's what you can do tomorrow. Absolutely. Uh, Pastor Brian, uh, go ahead. Uh, no, I think that uh, I'm not sure who said it, but it all boils down to economics. And I think that this uh, makes the case, especially how much of it in the industry has been on track funds uh, to how it is that we have been the stimulus package to the economy uh, in large and measurable ways, while most of the nation is cashless. Uh, much of what has been the undercurrent of currency still flowing uh, has been in this realm. And so uh, I think that just knocks right on the door. And, and let me just, and again, I, I need people to understand, uh, I challenge everybody. I, I have a very simple philosophy as a journalist. If you do good, I'll talk about you. If you do bad, I'll talk about you. At the end of the day, I'll talk about you. What I'm talking about on this very issue, how we have to challenge even even allies. And again, and just so just folks understand, I'm looking at here. Uh, and so we certainly appreciate uh, you got MPP was sponsoring this, you got house plants, you got PACs, you know, but you look at the company Canopy Growth, which is which is which is uh, you know a publicly traded company. I'm looking on the website. They got no black board members. I want to know, you know, in terms of who are the black executives. I want to know what black companies are they doing business with on minority supplier development. I want to know in terms of I see that's the whole thing here. See we can't, this is a global cannabis and hemp company. We have to challenge companies not to just say, hey, we're down with you and we're going to support you when it comes to this whole issue of decriminalization. We have to be saying, yeah, but also what are you doing to support, to advertise with, uh, to work with? Because that's how the game gets changed. We're in this space now where people are, are we going to give $5 million to Black Lives Matter? Okay, but you're making $10 billion. And so when you talk about reimagining this, if you leave out the economic piece to this, to Neil, your point, uh, 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 the, these, uh, when they were conf uh, confiscating stuff, that was an economic policy. That wasn't criminal, that was economics. And now this whole issue of legalization is economics. You cannot divorce money from anything in America. Absolutely, even in this case, public safety. So for those who are concerned about public safety, you have to have economic empowerment if you want to reduce crime. That's got, to, that, that is central to it. There, there are other things, but you have to have economic empowerment. And the industry needs to be accountable. Yes, and, and, we, and we need industry leaders, Natalie. We need industry leaders stepping up on the economic side without being asked or demanded and recognizing that this can we cannot have the cycle repeated again where black folks are left out again 
like we've seen throughout the history of this country. No, this is good. We're 23 years away now from America becoming a nation as majority of people of color. And the this, but, but we're, on a, we're on a path that we will be looking like South Africa, where you have black folks in the majority, but economically, they absolutely are not controlling their own country. Hopefully one of the listeners here has, or someone, maybe one of the panelists has, has a way to uh, start tracking these companies and, and, and develop some sort of uh, uh, how you have better business bureau, kind of like uh, shopping list. Okay, who are the companies that are doing the right thing, who are contributing oh. and, well, and making opportunities for blacks, you know, economic. Well, that's, in well, Neil, that's where the, that's where the NAACP comes in. Uh, okay. I remember under Kwesi and Fume, the NAACP had report cards where they tracked companies and they actually graded them on a particular scale. That's what needs to happen right now. All, and this is not just in the cannabis space. All these companies out here who are running their Black Lives Matter ads and saying, oh, Black Lives Matter. No, we got to be saying, but do your black employees matter? Do your black board members matter? Do your black senior executives matter? Do your black supplier development matters? I mean, again, we cannot remove money from anything in America. Uh, real quick, final comments. Natalie, I'm going to start with you. Yes, I agree with that. We need to hold people accountable. I want to give us, there's a, a list called the Accountability Project um, that is run by an organization called Caniclusive. They are starting to do that work. It is the beginning. There will be other organizations that, like the NAACP that I would love to see involved. And I think we need to be sure to share that information, support that work, and, and make sure it's going even further so we can understand exactly where the rubber is meeting the road for a lot of these well-capitalized uh, operators. Neil? Yeah, I'll be quick. In this place of police reform, we're, we're giving a lot of specific things that we want changed in policing but we're not talking enough about public policy. This is the number one piece of public policy reform that will make the biggest difference right here, right now in police reform, because it will dramatically reduce the contact between police and citizens. And when we do that, we'll have less uses of excessive force and far fewer people dying. That's one of the things that we need to do, change this piece of public policy. The catchy. Uh, yes, I just want to say that the long range implications of the criminalization of cannabis uh, has resulted in more people of color and the poor having stigmatizing felony uh, records with negative consequences, not just for people who might want to enter the, um, the burgeoning cannabis industry, but just in employment in general and in housing and public benefits and education and in voting and in the franchise. And what I think these companies need to do is really, really get in their heart with respect to changing these laws and policies that uh, uh, result so that people are adversely impacted by the criminal conviction that they are they are in, in faced with versus what people are making money off of now. Uh, Pastor Bryant. Uh, that great Maryland abolitionist Frederick Douglass said, I got more prayers answered when I got off my knees. Uh, and I want to challenge the black church across the country to not just pray about this crisis, but to get involved in it. Uh, he said that the answer to prayers is in your feet. Uh, and so let's uh, join our dear sister who's been going to Congress, going to Senate, and in the state legislatures, as well as let's walk all the way to the voting booths uh, and vote from the top to the bottom. And let me take a moment to challenge everybody, please fill out your census report. We're running woefully behind in our participation, uh, but I want to ask our churches, if you're uh, listening, to please be a part. Uh, all right, folks, uh, there's this uh, fabulous scene in the movie Malcolm X, uh, where Denzel Washington is playing the playing Malcolm X and uh, this police officer uh, after their brother Johnson was injured and the police officer uh, comes to him uh, and the police officer uh, says, uh, you've got what you want. Uh, now it's time to move on. I, I really love that particular uh, scene. And then Malcolm X says, no, I'm not satisfied. We cannot be satisfied with where we have come when it comes to the de decriminalization of marijuana. We need more district attorneys and actually electing more progressive district attorneys who are going to change policies and not continue to prosecute people uh, for minor drug offenses that contributes to mass incarceration, which means that people actually have to 
mobilize, organize, register, and then vote. You can't sit here and watch this Zoom and talk about, oh, how bad this is if you're not using the power of the ballot. But then, as Maynard Jackson said, there are three Bs. He says the ballot, the book, and the buck. The second thing is we have to be educated. Uh, that's where the book comes in on these laws and how they impact us. And the last one is the buck. We have to ensure that we are participating economically, not as consumers, but as owners. And I will specifically challenge PACs and Houseplant and, and, uh, and uh, also these other companies, uh, Canopy Growth, to lead the effort to challenge this industry to ensure that black folks are participating as owners. That is how we change the economic paradigm in this country. Steven, it's all yours. We can't hear you. Okay. You're on mute. Hey. Now we got you. All right. Well, 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 that was one heck of a panel, and I'm and I'm not surprised that that you all would 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 bring it home and and kick us off in, in the right way. Um, what I heard uh, and and what I got out of that panel clearly was that uh, the role of policing in the United States has been defined over this last half century. Uh, that we've been fighting this war on drugs and cannabis has been at the forefront of that and the disparity between how the police police can cannabis. There's a difference between how they do it in South Central Los Angeles and how they do it in Beverly Hills. And, and you all brought, brought home that up point and how it's tied into militarization of the police and, um, and civil asset for forfeiture. But I also heard the structural issues, right, around how all of this fits into a criminal justice dynamic that ties into economics, right, which is the history of how criminal justice has impacted African American opportunities in the uh, country. And the challenge for all of us as we think about Black Lives Matter, to think about it in, in the broader construct of not just criminal justice, but economic opportunity in the country. So I am Steve Hawkins again. I am uh, executive director of the Marijuana Policy Project. Welcome for folks who are coming in now to reimagining justice. Our discussion today around race, cannabis and policing in the United States. I wanna thank Roland Martin for leading the first panel and Neil Franklin and Kichi Taifa, Natalie Papillon and Reverend Jamal Bryan for their participation. And for our next panel, I wanna introduce my co-host, uh, Olivia Noggle, who works with me at the Marijuana Policy Project. Liv, take it away. Awesome, thanks so much for the introduction, Steve, and, and thank you all for joining us here today. Um, our next panel will focus on weaponizing cannabis to justify deadly encounters and victim blaming. And we are so happy to have another dynamic moderator for this discussion, who is our good friend, Mr. David Johns. David Johns is known for his passion, public policy acumen and fierce advocacy for youth. In 2013, Johns was appointed as the first executive director of the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for African-Americans by President Barack Obama. And he served until the last day of the Obama administration. David currently serves as the executive director of the National Black Justice Coalition, which is a civil rights organization dedicated to the empowerment of black LGBTQ people, including people living with HIV AIDS. Please welcome David Johns. I appreciate that. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you, Stephen, uh, for the work that you're doing for your leadership for making space for us to reimagine and to dream and to talk about not necessarily what's radical, uh, but what is required uh, for all of us to get free. I want to begin where the previous panel ended uh, and remind everyone to not only prepare to be able to vote uh, safely um, in this and every election, but to also ensure that you take the five minutes required to participate in the 2020 census um, so everybody get counted. 
Um, I want to underscore um, the foundation that was laid by the previous panel. Uh, and again, say thank you to Roland, to Natalie, to Neil, to Nkechi, and to Pastor Bryant for helping us to think about the role of messaging and the media and how it is that we are often victims of the state-sanctioned violence that uses marijuana to justify and explain uh, the ways in which we are traumatized. Um, it should be lost on no one that uh, cannabis consumption has been used as justification uh, in in the cases of Philando Castile uh, and Mike Brown, as well as in the case of Sandra Bland. The war on drugs and no-knock uh, warrants, which uh, were referenced uh, powerfully in the previous panel, um, Natalie provided the context and Ketchy talked about a lot of the contemporary components, um, but there are vestiges of that when we think about what is happening in the case of Breonna Taylor, as well as James Westcott and Henry McGee. Um, and it's important for me to acknowledge that there are intersectional implications for this conversation that are sometimes erased um, when we don't think about the needs or the unique experiences of people who are Black and LGBTQIA+. Um, and so I want to lift up the name of Ashanti Posey, a 17-year-old Black LGBTQ activist who was shot and killed in April of last year. And there was a Tennessee lawmaker who blocked what would have been resolution to honor her life and her work because she was allegedly involved in a low level marijuana sale prior to being murdered. Um, and so I'm joined by a panel of experts who I will introduce in this moment to help us think about the relationship between messaging and media and the stigma around cannabis and how it is often used to perpetuate harms and violence against those of us who are black. First joining me is got my good friend in this work. I've known her for quite some time. I won't say how long because uh, I won't age us, but it's Jasmine Rand. Um, Jasmine Rand is an attorney. Uh, she's a founding attorney of Rand Law uh, LLC, which is a Miami-based litigation firm. She excels in uh, catastrophic personal injury, uh, civil rape, wrongful death cases, as well as civil and human rights cases. Um, the work of MBJC um, has been enhanced by the leadership and work of Jasmine Rand. Um, and it was also a pleasure to honor her as uh, one of the National Bar Association's top 40 under 40 lawyers uh, in its uh, early inaugural year. Uh, we are also joined by Niambi McIntosh. Did I pronounce that right? Yes, Niambi McIntosh. Niambi McIntosh, thank you. Name, naming and words are important. Who is the last child of revolutionary musician and actor Peter Tush? Um, and uh, I won't go into more of the bio that was provided to me because I'm going to ask you a question. I will invite you to share some of that. But I want to say thank you uh, for your leadership and the responsibility that you have taken, not only to continue your family, your family's legacy, but to continue to engage in this particular mo moment in the movement as well. Um, and last but not least is Reverend Mark Thompson, who has spent most of his life as a political, civil rights and human rights activist and organizer. Uh, he has been a part of many of the uh, major uh, social social justice movement uh, for the last 35 years. Um, and I spent the last 10 years in particular as a television commentator and the host of Make It Plain, a daily political um, podcast featuring interviews with newsmakers of the day. Uh, if we were in person, I'd ask you all to join me in giving them a round of applause. But since we are on Zoom, I will not do that. Um, Jasmine, I want to start with you um, and ask you a question acknowledging the role of marijuana in the cases that you have been able to try. Um, and I want to highlight for those who don't know that Jasmine Rand has worked um, and represented the families of Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown. And so I want to ask you specifically, when you think about the conversation that has been had and the work in this regard, how did you see the use of cannabis weaponized against um, those two brothers in particular, um, and what impact did it have on both their cases um, and their families? And so, you know, part of the reason why I'm at this panel today is, is as you've said, David, to talk about the weaponization of cannabis against uh, African Americans and um, in within the civil rights community as well, because it impacts even our cases. And so where you have a victim like 17 year old Trayvon Martin, who was killed uh, by adult male George Zimmerman. And then again, in the case of Michael Brown, you have another young man that is killed by police officers, um, both young men unarmed. The character assassinations begin, you know, sometime shortly after uh, the protests calling for the arrest of Zimmerman and for the arrest of the police officer in Michael Brown's case. And one weapon that's used in the character assassination of my clients on a regular basis is whether or not there's any cannabis in their system. Um, and so, 
you know, that does a few things. And even thinking through the comments that I wanted to offer today, um, that makes the assumption that it's, it's within our society, you can still, you know, weaponize a person's character simply for their use of cannabis, even when cannabis now is legal in many states and legal in many countries. And, you know, in my opinion, it's not something that should be used um, to assassinate a person's character. But unfortunately, you know, too often in, in our society, it is. I appreciate that. I want to invite you to say um, a little bit more about the ways in which, uh, to the extent that you can, this also mm -hmm. uh, impacts families. Um, and I'm thinking yeah. previously about the the role of stigma, um, the history that Natalie shared that is often erased, um, and the ways in which it is continually weaponized by not only politicians, but by the police who are employed by states to in, in, uh, inflict drunk uh, Violence, And so how do you talk to families about not only the way in which uh, cannabis use or right. alleged cannabis use is weaponized in the media, uh, but with how to think about it more broadly? Um, yeah, it's obviously something that's very difficult for the family, because the whole purpose of using cannabis to, to weaponize the family is to make them feel, you know, a sense of shame about the fact that their child, you know, may have used cannabis before his or her death. And so it becomes a very tough moment um, for the family in dealing with, you know, the press and the media and the negativity and the use of cannabis as something as a weapon against the family. And so, you know, in dealing with the families, we have to remind them that no matter what happened, you know, prior to, for example, Trayvon or Michael Brown's death, that neither one of them invited the violence that happened to them, that, you know, it's not an assassination on their character that there was some small amount of cannabis, you know, found in both of their bodies. And that much like the bias based on racism itself, the bias that people have that, that they viewed him as a criminal simply because of the color of his skin, that the the, there was additional bias um, against their sons because there was cannabis found in their systems. And so, you know, we have to talk to them and, and encourage them that, you know, we can't be silenced. And, and, and it really, with both Sabrina and with Michael Brown's mother, it didn't take much encouragement because they're both strong advocates. And so it didn't really dissuade them from, you know, speaking and advocating for their sons, but it is meant to discourage people from advocating for their children and to fight predominantly against police who are the ones who are really weaponizing this uh, against the black community. Um, and, and I'll share one more story in, in terms of an effective fight that Ben Crump and I actually had uh, against the weaponization of cannabis. And that was a, a case in Jamaica involving a young man named Mario Dean. Um, Mario Dean was a construction worker and he was on his way to work and arrested with a single spliff, uh, which is a, a single joint in Jamaica. And um, that was the only crime he had committed. It was still not legal at the time to have a small amount for personal use. And he was beaten to death um, by the guards in jail. And he actually died on Jamaica's Independence Day. And so Ben and I represented um, his family and through the, doc the help of Dr. Michael Bad and had an independent autopsy performed on on Mario, and it proved that he did not fall off a bunk bed and die as they had lied about, that he was actually beaten in custody, and that he was beaten in custody just because he had possession of a split. And, you know, his case made a tremendous impact in Jamaica. Um, the following week, the, the director of national security, security issued a statement that police officers, even though it's still legal to do so, that they should stop arresting people for small amounts of personal use of cannabis. And a few months later, I, I want to say six months later about um, cannabis was actually decriminalized in the country. And so it's really important that we continue to fight back and to continue to fight um, for equality. And I have seen, for example, I mean, a significant change in, in Jamaica. And I think the advocacy work of, of people um, like Steve Hawkins are making, you know, incredible change in this nation, but we need to keep fighting to create more change state by state. Yeah, I appreciate you, Jasmine, uh, for taking us to Jamaica and for highlighting a form of intersectionality, right? One of the ways in which 
uh, blackness is flat and is that we forget that there are Afro Jamaicans and there are Afro Caribbeans and that mm -hmm. we exist in these intersectional ways that are often erased. Um, Niambi, I want to stay in that space uh, and particularly because Jasmine talked about the impact of marijuana and stigma as it affects the children and, and, and parents of children who are uh, murdered, are victims of state sanctioned violence. And I want to honor and celebrate that your father is one of, I won't just say Jamaica's, but the world's most renowned reggae artist. Um, and I want to invite you to talk about the way in which he was treated by the police, of course, before this more recent legalization of marijuana um, in Jamaica. Yeah. Um, so my father was, you know, one of the founding members of the Whalers. Um, Bob Marley, Peter Tosh is my dad, and Bunny Whaler made up the Whalers. Uh, he went on to have a solo career in 1976, where he released the iconic album um, Legalize It, which really has been um, the single has been the anthem for the legalization movement uh, across the globe. Uh, and you, pr pretty much any video or any picture that you see him um, or any interview, he's, he's um, speaking about the medicinal benefits of the plant. He's speaking about how it could uplift the economy. And he speaks about how it's really only black and brown people and the poor that are targeted by the, um, you know, by by the police. And he points out that everyone consumes cannabis in the song Legalize it. He says lawyers, doctors, and judges use it um, because it, it was it was a point. And he he really um, made a point to consume cannabis no matter where he was, on stage, on a concert, Germany, uh, in the US, in Canada. And you would think that he did it, he was doing it, it with ease. But the reality is that uh, he was constantly um, targeted by the police. Um, he, there's been a point in time when he was, police came into his home and dragged him out and uh, broke his ribs and, and beat him over a, 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 you know, a split for a draw, a blunt, whatever we would call it relatively in, in the United States. Um, and or joint. And so there's been times when he would be driving and um, police would pull him over. He's six four, so he's someone that sticks out. You can see him. Um, and police would, you know, there's been times when he was beat almost to death um, for his advocacy. And so uh, that didn't, um, that type of um, experience was something that although he was facing that brutality, it didn't stop him from, from being an advocate for the legalization. And, and he uh, wasn't the only one um, that did that. My family comes from a Rastafari background and the, the faith is, holds can, uh, cannabis as a sacrament. They understand the spiritual benefits and we understand that um, the medicinal benefits as well. And so, um, you know, that the, the fact that spirituality really isn't in the conversation and a national conversation and, and recognized to be something that's recognized um, within state regulations is, is also very, very critical. And so, um, you know, my father's legacy uh, pretty much lived on, you know, far beyond, but it's not something that he did with ease and, and he was constantly brutalized for, for cannabis possession. And not only him, but your brother as well. Will you share a bit about what happened to him following his arrest for cannabis in New Jersey? Yes, I, I will. Um, in 2013, my brother was arrested for cannabis possession, uh, Father's Day weekend. Um, it was um, three months later where he had his first hearing. Um, so he was incarcerated without a hearing until um, September of that year. Uh, my family and everyone drove down to, to finally hear, um, to go to the hearing. And that's when we heard the prosecutor offer him a 20 year um, plea. Uh, he is a father of four. He has never been arrested before. He um, is a follower of, follower of Rastafari um, and an activist and a musician as well in his regard. And um, this was what uh, the state of New, New Jersey thought was an appropriate sentence. Um, he ended up making bail uh, the end of that year in December. And for 
from 2013 to 2016, he was going back and forth for pretrial um, motions. First, they would say, you know, 15 years is the best that we can do. Um, and you need to take the plea. You better take the plea or, you know, you're going to be made an example of. Uh, he was told then it would go down to 10 years. And, and then they, you know, and then it'll go down and eventually went down to five. And he was torn between really standing up for what he believed in and what his, what our faith was, um, what his faith is and, um, and being made an example of, you know, he didn't want to be taken out of the life of, of his family, but eventually he did decide to take a plea and hoping that he would be able to get time served and, and have, and be able to put this, this situation behind him. In 2017, in January, he turned himself in and he was at Bergen County Jail. And for he was there for a month and a half before being attacked, brutally attacked by another inmate. Um, he suffered a traumatic brain injury and, and to this day is unable to do anything with for himself. He can't walk at this point, can't talk, um, needs to be turned by, by by myself or the, or different family members or nurses care and needs 24 hour care. Um, and so um, I remember when we got the call about his, his injury, um, it was from a hospital and my mom was calling, she was frantic on the phone and she, she said, there's a doctor on the phone. They, they said they need to do a life saving um, procedure on him and do we authorize it? And um, we did at the time and then flew to New Jersey. We were actually based in Boston. When we got to New Jersey into the ICU, they, um, he was surrounded by police. He had tubes down his throat, um, a neck brace on, he, his face was, was swollen and he had a handcuff on his ankle. And um, we really pushed um, the hospital. You know, it was devastated to see that this, here he is fighting for his life, but you know, treated like an animal, you know, with, with a handcuff on his ankle. And um, when we asked the hospital about um, the handcuff and if we could remove this so that, you know, I'm like, that's not helping his medical condition. Uh, they told us that the prison had hierarchy over the hospital. And uh, we were also told that um, we're lucky that we could visit my brother. Um, you know, we normal, our normal protocol is that we don't allow visitors. And so, you know, fortunately, I think that it was my father's name that allowed us to really be by my brother's side while he fought for his life, because at that state, it was life and death. He was literally, he was in the ICU and his vitals were completely un unstable. But, um, you know, most families don't have that opportunity. Most family, a mother will show up and they'll just send her back home. And, you know, she may hear about her loved one or her son or her daughter dying in the hospital without any answers. Um, it took them, you know, a few days before we had an incident report to find out what happened. Um, we were constantly bullied by the correctional officers that were surrounding him. They were trying, treating us like prisoners. And so this is, this is our, you know, our, our criminal justice system that we live in. And, before this, we had really no relationship with the criminal justice system. And I think a lot of us have that luxury. And so, you know, I, I thought it was very important. We launched the Justice for Gerard campaign to really let people know that, um, you know, know my brother's story, but really push for criminal justice reform. My brother has no violent history. And uh, if anyone in this country is making money off of cannabis, no one should be arrested for it. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and I want to thank you for sharing that uh, and for your family's uh, uh, legacy of advocacy. Um, thank you. Uh, Reverend uh, Thompson, I want to ask you, acknowledging all that you have seen uh, over the course of your lifetime and your career as an advocate, um, how does what Jasmine and Niambi shared resonate with you? Um, and how are you thinking about what all of this means, in particular, the fight for legalization of an equity within cannabis consumption and marijuana usage as it relates to this broader focus on and fight for the recognition of all black lives? Well, first of all, uh, thank you for having me. And I especially want to shout out my brother, Stephen Hawkins, who has been a pioneer in this type of work when it comes to activism. You know, Stephen and I first worked together on abolition of the death penalty. 
And uh, now that has evolved, uh, his work has evolved to include um, the legalization of marijuana and also ending, obviously, as we're talking today, the weaponizing of cannabis. Um, and that's very, very important. Um, I was very fortunate to have been taught and mentored by a great scholar by the name of Dr. Sharshi McIntyre. She wrote a book years ago entitled Criminalizing a Race. And I would encourage people to check it out because she documented how the 13th Amendment was drafted and written and then used to do just that, to criminalize our people. And it wasn't too long after that. And in fact, as early as the 30s, we all know the history of when cannabis was first um, uh, marketed and propagandized, shall we say, to be something that would be very, very negative and something that um, would be criminalized. Um, and then as we look uh, going back to the 80s, a lot of conversations in the past two presidential races about uh, crime bills and what have you, we found that in each of these instances, our people were particularly targeted. And at different times, you know, there were different, different drugs that were brought to the fore. But the one that has remained the most consistently eligible uh, for our enemies to weaponize has been cannabis. Um, Ari Melba on MSNBC did almost a, a documentary segment um, uh, speaking of, of Sister Niambe's family story, a, a documentary segment of the targeting of black artists and musicians when it comes to cannabis. So what I think we have to continue to fight is this weaponization. And again, cannabis has been the consistent target for law enforcement. And I know at one time, and I'm not sure what the current numbers are, but when you had 13% of African-American men um, under mass incarceration, practically the same percentage as the black, pop black population, population itself, then what you have is really de facto disenfranchisement. And so that's how many of us aren't able to vote and make a decision in terms of a lot of the policies that are being made when it comes to cannabis and everything else. Um, and I think the, the latest numbers are that uh, cannabis arrests account for, I think about almost 50, 43% of all drug arrests. And of those arrests, almost 90% were for possession alone. Uh, that's non. Those are nonviolent offenses, and people shouldn't be locked up for that. Nor is it disenfranchised. And I'll just say at this moment, in closing, for those who have embraced the Black Lives Matter movement, and obviously that's all of us. But I'm talking about people who, for whom this is still new, um, who were activated after seeing the George. Floyd video. This is a teachable moment in that regard when it comes to weaponization. Because in each of these, each of these most uh, recent Black Lives Matter cases, they have tried to use cannabis as a weapon. They uh, allegedly found it in all the victims' systems. They accused uh, Trayvon Martin of it and, and Sandra Bland and, and Michael Brown. Um, the raid on Breonna Taylor, um, the, whomever they were looking for that they had originally already caught was someone that they had accused of distributing um, cannabis. Even Ahmaud Arbery, they brought up something back three years ago, accusing him of possession. And let's not forget, uh, even Tamir Rice's mother had to face that accusation. So this is how it's weaponized. And we still have a generational issue, even within our own community, David. I can remember just, you know, in less, less than a decade ago, that gener generationally, 
African-Americans were split when it came down to marriage equality. And with the help of the first black president, that changed. You don't see as much resistance to that idea. The laws have changed, the country changed. But there's still something about attaching someone, even one of these victims I just named, to marijuana that generationally trips our folk out. And some people old is still have a thing. They still aren't quite there on legalization. And even if they're in favor of legalization, there's still somewhat of that tiny stigma there. And I think that's the struggle we're in now. We've got to continue to change that attitude amongst our own people. And for those outside of the black community, we've got to let them know that if you're about Black Lives Matter, that this is not just a moment, but a movement. And if you're about that movement, then across the board, you have to favor all things that render justice unto our people so that if cannabis is fully legalized, then that ends forever. A lot of these raids, a lot of these arrests, a lot of these pullovers, and a lot of the surveillance that ends up with our people losing their lives in many of these situations. Received completely. Let's stay in this space. I want to um, honor time. It's the most precious resource people have, and uh, we can't get it back. We have a little bit more than 15 minutes, so I'm going to ask you all to think about responding as you would um, on Twitter, not the new version with the elongated uh, additional capacity, but the old version. Uh, and so the first question that comes to mind for me, uh, and this is reflecting upon your comments, uh, Reverend, is how. Uh, what is required in this moment of reimagining for us to get to this place uh, where raids and uh, harassment of Black people and the targeting of the poor um, and Latinx folks or queer folks um, uh, is not, uh, cannabis is not used as the excuse or the reason to do that. Um, uh, what's required? What's the how? What does the reimagining look like? Um, why don't we start with you, Niambi, and then we can work our way back. Um, well, a lot of people, let me make sure I'm, am I, yeah, so a lot of people yeah, don't yeah. know the history, you know, and I think that we have to start with the history. Harry J. Ensingler in the 1930s was the um, director of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. He is quoted saying that marijuana is the most violence causing drug in history of mankind. Um, he also is quoted by saying that, and a lot of people don't know this, but he says, quoted by saying that there are 100,000 total marijuana smokers in the US and most are Negroes, Hispanics, Filipinos, and entertainers. Their satanic music, jazz, and swing result in the marijuana usage. The marijuana causes white women to seek sexual relations with the Negroes, entertainers, and any others. And this is the propaganda that was pushed from that point. Before then, cannabis was legal. And once they decided to make it illegal, it was very racialized. And since then, a lot of that propaganda still has been embedded in the mindset of so many people. And they don't understand why they have this like weariness about cannabis, but it comes from uh, global propaganda that has been used to misinform people. Um, and it starts with education. Yeah, Reverend, acknowledging that, uh, how do we um, address that uh, propaganda, uh, uh, dismantle the stigma and otherwise get free? Well, I think we have to continue to push it and um, push the issue and, and push it tirelessly. You use the word uh, propaganda. And we're in a war when it comes to mainstream mass media. Unfortunately, you know, our people don't have as media, as black media, the reach that others do. And, and as someone who's been involved in radio, I, I'll give an example. How many of you have ever heard a song on the radio you don't like, but the radio station keeps playing it every day? But what happens before you know it, within a couple of weeks, you're singing the song. We've got to combat that power of suggestion. Um, Roland Martin just left here, my brother. So he's he's texted me while we're talking. And he said, Mark, remind him about an investment in black media. So I'm going to say that because he said it. Um, where we have these businesses and we're, we're making money when it comes to cannabis, there has to be an investment in, in, in programming and information. And as Sister Niambi said, in education, 
um, to reverse some of these myths and some of the propaganda that our enemies are, are putting out there. So we've got to do all we can, all we can not only to reverse that, but all of us need to be also singing uh, from the same sheet of music that if we want to talk about Black Lives Matter, if we want to talk about even defunding the police or abolishing the police, that argument begins with legalization and an end to weaponization. Because again, that is, that is the contact, that is the issue that often puts us in direct uh, contact with these no good cops. So we need to take the focus off um, THC in terms of what is accused of what's pe in people's systems, but instead change THC to these hellish cops and do all we can to get them out of our lives. Okay, I see what you did there. I, I, I noticed that. Uh, Jasmine, uh, let's stay in this space. Uh, I'm gonna come back to the role of uh, influencers and celebrities in a second, but I wanna ask you, Jasmine, what's the work now with regard to uh, freedom for individuals who have been black people, poor people, Latinx folks, queer people who have been incarcerated, who are still incarcerated right now for petty marijuana charges? Well, I kind of want to go back to what Nyambi said about education, because I think that's so important, is that leaders, even like myself, attorneys, judges, we all need re-education about cannabis and how cannabis has used, has been used as a weapon in our nation. And so on one end of the spectrum, we are legalizing, which is great, but what are we doing once we legalize it to really improve our systems and not just improve the system going forward, but how do we rectify this horrible past that we've created? And so number one, we need to understand this word weaponization and, and the, the realm of cannabis sounds big, right? It, it's not something easy to understand because you know cannabis isn't an AK-47. The results of what cannabis does aren't always instantaneous. It's not like a bullet hits somebody and they die. Um, it's not like a chokehold where we can see somebody kneeling on somebody's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds and then they're dead. Sometimes it kills quickly, sometimes it kills slowly. Sometimes cops kill people with guns over cannabis. Sometimes cannabis claims people's lives in the form of lifelong prison sentences, um, which arguably, arguably is not much, it's not much of a life. It's not much better than death to live your entire life in prison. And so cannabis quite literally is a weapon. And now that we are identifying problems within the legal system, now that we're legalizing, how do we go back and restore voting rights how do we go back and restore people's records so that they're able to get housing, to get jobs, to vote? And so I think that there has to be a mass restoration of rights to correct what we have done historically in terms of weaponizing cannabis. And then we have to think critically going forward about it. Cops are not happy because it's a weapon taken out of their arsenal. And so we need to, to really fully acknowledge that cannabis is a weapon in many different ways and claims the lives of people in many different ways and then figure out how do we move forward and ensure that we're dealing with this on every level, not just simply legalizing it? Yep, I appreciate that. Sorry, the challenges of uh, working from home during a pandemic. Um, I want to stay in this space and go back to both points that Niambi and that the Reverend made and, and, and acknowledge that there are Black entertainers, celebrities, influencers who are in this moment profiting, legally profiting from cannabis consumption and marijuana use. Uh, and so I want to ask the question of what is their role and responsibility in the movement? Uh, what should we be asking of them? And I, I, I say this acknowledging the moment, uh, again, both Niambi and Jasmine and talking about teaching the babies. I say this acknowledging the moment when I had to talk to my niece Jordan about what Rihanna was holding in her hand uh, in a picture, right? And, and, and again, knowing that there are some uh, among us who seem to be at least on the surface uh, celebrated for their freedom with cannabis use, right? Again, to the point in the stories that Niambi shared, we often don't know what's going on when people aren't taking the pictures or in those moments. But what are we asking of people who are in positions of privilege? I think that it's, um, you know, my family, like I said, is, is we are uh, follow the Rastafari faith and to us cannabis is a plant. But my daughter, my daughter has a stuffed cannabis leaf animal and, it's <laughs> and we call them leafy, the healing plant. I think that, you know, we have to be able to have candid conversations um, about it. You know, there's so much stigma um, and we tend to hide um, knowledge from people, you know, I think that if you educate, educate people about the pros, you know, and the cons of, of cannabis use, um, then they're able to be a lot more um, 
you know, a lot more uh, responsible with with their decisions that they make. And as and as entertainers and and influencers, I think that you know goes right back to this to my same point is making sure that we're that you're that you're educated and you're giving also the the medicinal benefits and also some of the harms that can be done um, by cannabis for certain people. It is a neuroprotective. You know, people say, "Oh, I I don't smoke it recreationally, but I smoke it for 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 medicine." Um, adult use is adult use. You know, and and no matter how you smoke it, you're still receiving the medicinal benefits benefits from it. So I think that it, it really comes with, with us um, acknowledging some of our reservations as adults, um, you know, and, it, and it's going to start, have, you know, start to have those conversations, um, at a, you know, with young people at a, at a really young age. Um, education is education. It's, it's always going to be powerful. The kindergarten teacher in me wants to ask, is there, uh, is, is there an age that's too young? No, no, because um, education is continuous, you know, and so my daughter may have not known all of the medicinal benefits, all of the um, controversy around um, the plant at the age of two, but she at least knew the word cannabis, you know, she knew what the plant looked like. And then as the time progressed, those conversations became deeper. She was able to understand that her grandfather was an activist, that he was brutalized over the plant, that, you know, Black people are often targeted. Now she's nine years old. She she has a deeper understanding of, of, the, of the plant. So I think that there's never an age that's too young because the world will give you misinformation. And the last thing we want is the world to teach our young children. We want to be the responsible responsible ones to give them the education that they need. Yep. Nine years old, third grade. That's an important year. Um, Reverend Thompson, you spend a lot of time in conversation with celebrities and influencers. Uh, what is their role in uh, destigmatizing uh, cannabis use and marijuana consumption? Well, again, you know, we're still dealing with, with information and the power of suggestion and all of that. They have a very important role to play. And, you know, something Jasmine just said, a moment ago, which kind of got me to thinking, we have a, a bit of popular cognitive dissonance. Because if we're in this moment of more conversation about legalization, and obviously more people are open to that, more people change their minds about that, you can't have legalization and weaponization going on simultaneously. And so this has to be taken very, very seriously. And those who are in positions of influence uh, and who are very popular in media and elsewhere, elsewhere, and those who are even profiting have to, I think, speak out even more loudly against the weaponization, especially in this America racial reckoning moment, moment as well. Um, we can't divorce um, Black Lives Matter and the deaths of people at the hands of the police from the weaponization of cannabis and then therefore can't divorce it from legalization. So um, like I just did right there, we can talk about two or three things in one sentence. Um, and I think it's important for people who are at levels of influence, who are very popular and who are house, household names to say that um, as loudly, if not more loudly than anybody else. Yeah, I received that and also want to uh, uh, double tap and, and add a comment under people who don't know the history, who are ignorant about the benefits of, um, as well as the challenges associated with, for some people, cannabis use should also get out of the way, stop talking about things they know nothing about and otherwise doing harm. Uh, while we do this work, and I also want to honor what Niketch, you said earlier about corporations and companies that are profiting from all of this, um, and, and there's corporate accountability to, to be had as well. Jasmine, I think about and I worry about our babies uh, who will be caught in uh, the tension that that Reverend talked about that otherwise shouldn't exist, right? That practically for those people who have access to privilege vis-a-vis -vis mm -hmm. their whiteness or their uh, zip code, um, they get to celebrate cannabis legalization. However, those of us who have uh, skin that's been kissed by the sun are still cursed by the, 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 the assault on another crime or on, on drugs, right? The war on drugs, rather. Um, and so what do you say, what do we say to our babies um, as they stand in this gap while we continue to do this very important work? I mean, I think, you know, 
we need to educate our children, as Niambi said, but I think we need to fully advocate. I think sometimes, even in the civil and rights communities, we just, we still aim a little too low. And even as I'm thinking, as we're discussing this, what are the responsibilities of celebrities and corporations? The responsibility of them, the responsibility of our federal government is everything. They have criminalized cannabis um, for I don't even know how long in this nation now. Black and brown people paid for it with their lives and now corporations are getting paid. Um, the right to legalize it was paid for by black and brown people, not by white America. So why is white America now allowed to profit? Um, why haven't you know, certain portions of the industry been set aside specifically for black and brown people, for the Rastafari community? Um, even as I observe the process of legalization in Jamaica, I think the legalization too oftentimes is, you know, there's a humanitarian push behind it, but I think a lot of times when the government decides to finally legalize, it's for profit. It's not necessarily because they want to eliminate the underlying human rights abuses and we need to hold their feet to the fire. So in Jamaica, if Jamaica is gonna legalize, then why isn't the Rastafari community who has been persecuted their entire lives for generations over this plant, why aren't they the ones benefiting financially? Why aren't black and brown people benefiting financially here in the United States, why aren't those companies paying to restore the rights of, of the people who lost their rights? You know, we say these things like they're pie in the sky arguments, they're not, it's common sense. And I think that our government makes us feel like those type of ass are pie in the sky when when it's, it's what's fair and it's what's just. Yeah, I appreciate that and want to say thank you to each of you, Niambi, uh, Reverend Thompson, and Jasmine Rand for the work that each of you do each and every day to ensure that all of us can be free. Uh, Jasmine, it's not lost on me that uh, in that last response, you invited in uh, Professor Derek Bell, uh, who reminds us that entrance mm -hmm. convergence is all, 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 always required for white people to do things, especially within the context of the law that benefit them. Um, in ways that also respond to the trauma that Black folks have been forced to endure. Uh, and so I want to say, again, thank you, honoring the spirit of Maya Angelou, who said that most of y'all will forget most of what we said, but hope that the spirit of people who are working to ensure that Black lives matter um, and that that's not called mm -hmm. into question based on assumptions around cannabis use or stigma associated with uh, marijuana use um, gets in the way. And so I want to say thank you again to Stephen, to Olivia, uh, to the folks working behind the scenes, Joe Take and Christina Q. Uh, for all of your work in hosting uh, this opportunity for us to reimagine uh, and to really think about all of the work that's required for all of us to be able to show up uh, and fully participate in, in all um, societies and economies as we so choose um, with or without cannabis and the decision uh, of resting with us. So thank you all. Um, I hope that the rest of this convening is as productive and engaging as it has been thus far for me. Great. I'd like to extend um, a big thank you again to David Johns for leading this panel. Um, and thank you to each of the panelists, Jasmine Rand, Niambi McIntosh, um, and Reverend Mark Thompson for joining us in this important conversation today. Um, as the panelists have illustrated here so well, we've seen perceived or actual cannabis use used as a justification of countless tragedies and used as a rationale to tarnish victims. And as Jasmine stated, as character assassination, and so the insights and experiences that our, our panelists shared are a necessary part of this conversation and are really important for people to hear so that we can do that work to reverse this stigmatizing narrative um, and weaponization of cannabis and cannabis use. So thank you so much. Um, and with that, Steve, I'm going to turn it back to you um, for what we have next on our agenda today. Hey, thanks, Liv. I, um, I, I want to uh, start by first just acknowledging our sponsors uh, in, in this space. Uh, we've had great support from both Houseplant and from PAX. And let me say that uh, these corporate partners, PAX and Houseplant, are two of the more progressive companies in the cannabis space. I, I, I appreciate so much their, their effort to help make this program possible today and appreciate also their commitment to uh, justice reform and to furthering a more equitable cannabis industry. Uh, Liv, hey, why don't we share a bit with everyone some of the work that MPP is doing uh, in terms of trying to legalize at the state level? 
Definitely. Um, so as far as MPP's um, state legislative work, we are working to legalize cannabis for adults with a strong focus on social equity in several additional states next year. Um, those include Connecticut, Maryland, New Hampshire, Delaware, Virginia, and also potentially Minnesota. Um, we'll also be working with patients and advocates to pass compassionate medical cannabis legislation in states like South Carolina, um, Kentucky, and also potentially um, Alabama. And then finally, um, we'll also be working to expand expungement and other um, social justice provisions in states that have already legalized or decriminalized cannabis. Thanks, Liv. I also think we're um, looking at some opportunities that might be there in Pennsylvania. And hey, we're looking at at least four ballot initiatives this fall in um, Montana, South Dakota, uh, New Jersey, and, um, and Arizona. And if all four of those pass, as well as the medical bill in um, uh, our the medical ballot initiative, I think there'll probably be one in Nebraska, and there's definitely one in Mississippi. And it, it just, again, shows the the change that's going on in the country. And we have 11 states right now that have fully legalized cannabis use. Uh, MPP has been at the vanguard in, in most of those states. Uh, and we might very well see another eight, nine, 10 states legalized over the next year. So very, very exciting times. Uh, I wanna turn now and share with the audience a video that we put together. Well, thank you all again for joining these important discussions today. Uh, you are tuning in to Reimagining Justice, a conversation about race, cannabis, and policing. For those of you who are following us on Facebook Live or on YouTube, please share with your friends, use the hashtag Reimagining Justice so that we can extend and continue this important conversation. I wanna now introduce um, our fireside chat and very excited to be bringing to you all today, uh, Ben Jealous and Al Harrington. Uh, let me start by saying a, a few words about Ben. I have known Ben since he was 16 years old and, uh, and met him uh, uh, at a uh, function uh, in, with the Ethical Cultural Society in Westchester, New York. Ben has risen um, through the ranks and I remember saying back then that he'd be my boss one day and when he went to be the youngest person to ever run the NAACP, uh, he invited me to join him uh, in, in that effort. Ben now serves as the president and CEO of People for the American Way and glad to have Ben here today. We are also joined by Al Harrington who uh, should be joining us. Um, Al is, has spent a career initially as a professional basketball player. Um, at six foot nine, uh, Al was uh, someone who they thought would earn his living in the, in the paint, but became a well-respected three-point shooter. And Al has continued to, um, I think, exceed people's expectations as the CEO of Viola Brands. Um, our, our Viola, excuse me. So Al is one of the leading black entrepreneurs in the cannabis space. And I am pleased to be able to create this fireside chat that brings together Al and Ben. So Al, are, are, are you on board? I see Ben. So 
let's uh, let's start it off. Um, ben, let Ben, let me begin with um, with a you. Um, you you uh, come to to this discussion, Ben, as somebody who has worked on civil rights uh, and human rights uh, a great part of your career, but you also come with the lens of having worked as a venture capitalist. Uh, You've worked in as an executive in in the um, in the uh, uh, tech space. So, um, how do you see both the progressive community and the corporate community coming together and tackling these issues um, around around policing, around a more equitable society, connected to criminal justice reform and um, cannabis legalization? You know, there's, there's a lot there in my mind and it goes in a few different directions. You know, there's a lot of kids right now, Steve, frankly, growing up the way that you grew up, you know, um, people that they love, mentors in and out, right, of prison, um, families that are struggling. And, and it seems like the edge has gotten sharper. You know, my mom grew up in the housing projects in Baltimore and I was back in McCullough Homes, where she grew up the other day. And I've never seen the levels of despair that we're seeing right now. Um, all these big crises that, that we're dealing with in this country, COVID, Trump, the recession that both have brought us, um, they're sort of sharpest in the places where people were already struggling most. And I think that we have to, to center that in, in the urgency that we feel. And um, and have to remember, you know, and to let those kind of personal memories um, of tougher times just sort of remind us why we work up, we wake up, and we work as hard as we do. The um, the uprisings that we've seen, like all uprisings, have been sparked by police brutality. But that you and I both know, I mean, personally, that like, that, that lighter's flashing all the time, right? And what did what determines whether or not it, it like catches blaze and roars like we've seen is underlying anxiety about joblessness, unemployment and housing usually have been the big three. In this moment, we would add healthcare to that as well. The, the urgency for us to add advanced justice therefore has never been greater. The urgency for us to keep people out of jail needlessly has never begun greater. You know, you look down the list of states that are, that are where COVID is out of control, and you may be surprised to see California on the list. And you dig into that, and what you find is they totally mismanage how they handle this in the prisons. And prisons are, whether it's HIV or tuberculosis or COVID, are just massive generators and accelerators of socially transmitted diseases. Um, and 85% of the people in prison come home, right? Um, and so what I see when it comes to cannabis, you see like Altria, you know, making greater investments and things like that, is that the days are numbered for it to be illegal in so many places that the day is coming when it will be legal federally. Uh, and, you know, I just had a friend murdered. Uh, it was a cannabis entrepreneur who, like so many others, was forced to store his cash on his property. And um, he was murdered with a sawed off submachine gun by folks who targeted him uh, for the wealth that was stored on his property. And so, you know, I, and again, this moment, we should be pushing hard for cannabis legalization everywhere we can here in Maryland. Um, there is a thriving illegal trade, even though you can get a medical card pretty easily. That trade is used to fund sex trafficking and a whole bunch of things that are you know, far more horrible than cannabis consumption. And, um, and it also sends people into jails and prisons needlessly who are then exposed you know, to COVID and everything else. So, I do think that there's been a number of dynamics that suggest that the days are numbered and we should just lean in uh, and make cannabis legal as quickly as possible everywhere that we can in this moment. And we should use 
um, the the urgency of the moment to accelerate it and to and to and to, and to harden our resolve rather than to suggest that it's a a distraction or you know a nice to have but not a need to have because you know where your family comes from where my family comes from where many of our cousins are still rooted like this is a this is an urgent crisis that is only made more urgent by COVID because it's just one more needless reason we're sending people to jail uh, and accelerating, you know, this this disease that's likely to be with us for a couple of years uh, at the very least. Thanks. So that's where my head's at right now, man. And I'm ultimately heartened to your conversation, your question about corporate um, involvement. I am I am heartened by two things. One, I'm heartened by the corporations that are investing in cannabis and therefore I think hastening the day when this, this whole crazy legal situation, which is, you know, uh, has, has always had an element of racism running through it, is ended. And the second is, I'm seeing a lot of folks more willing to get courageous about conversations about race and racism in their workplaces and also to be allies uh, to, to changing the way that, for instance, public safety happens in local in local communities and all of that is a very good sign but um but you know as far as the you know the, the purpose of the marijuana policy project i think that it's just become more 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 urgent thanks ben hey i see we we got al harrington on now brother al good 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 to see you i'm good man how you doing today good good so al i i, I saw you on television twice in the days after George Floyd was uh, tragically killed by, by the police in, in Minneapolis. On one show, you were, may, maybe it was CNBC, and you were talking about Black entrepreneurship in the cannabis space. Then, Al, I saw you, I think, on CNN the next day talking uh, talking about George Floyd's case and, and your own experience being pulled over by LAPD while driving your Rolls Royce. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, ex, you, know, ex, you know, give folks some sense of what that dynamic is like for, for you as a progressive social justice entrepreneur, but still a black man in the United States, uh, not immune from policing in, in the day in and, and, and the day out. Um, love, lo love to hear you answer that question and then make sure that I get out of the way so you and Ben can, uh, can uh, talk together. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, that's something that, you know, for me, I, you know, growing up in Orange, New Jersey, I thought it was just normal to be harassed by the police. You know what I'm saying? It just was part of like every day. You see it all the time. You know, I, you know, Obviously, I was always a bigger kid for my age, so I could always be, you know, when I was 10, I probably could have been mistaken for a 13 or 14 or 15 year old. And, you know, I remember stopping frisk happening to me twice when I was a kid, when, you know, cops jumped out the car, told all of us to get up against the wall, you know, went through all of our pockets and different things like that. So, you know, it was something that, you know, since I was very young, you know what I'm saying, I've always seen, you know, kind of police, you know, just harassing um, you know, young African Americans, you know what I'm saying, or young Americans, Black Americans. And, um, you know, when I got to the NBA, you know, you would think that maybe that would stop, right? You know, you think that, you know, you're a celebrity, you're, you, know, you play for the local team here, different things like that. And, you know, I was assaulted by the police when I played for the Indiana Pacers one night on, uh, you know, Thanksgiving Eve. And then one time when I played for the Knicks, I thought I was leaving a fundraiser for a Haiti relief. And, you know, the most recent things that have happened to me have been here in L.A., you know, since I've been retired. And, you know, uh, one day I was just leaving the office, headed to a meeting uh, in Beverly Hills. And, you know, police pulled me over because they said I didn't have a tag on my car. I just got the car and, you know, took me, you know, walked up to my car with, you know, with the gun, with the guns out, uh, made me get out the car. I had on shorts and a T-shirt. They asked me, do I have weapons on me? And I'm like, you can tell I don't have any weapons on me. They put me in handcuffs and like threw me up against the wall. You know what I'm saying? It kept me there while they, you know, illegally searched my vehicle. And, you know, for me, you know, most people say, why didn't you complain? Why didn't you go to the police station and file a complaint? And I didn't do it because I've heard so many people in the past that do that and nothing ever happens. You know what I'm saying? They never, we, you know, 
our society never hold police officers accountable. And, you know, over the last, I guess, you know, six to eight years, I mean, police officers have been killing black people on camera. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know how much more evidence you need than a camera showing you what happened. And they still walk and they still go to work the next day and different things like that. And I think obviously with the George Floyd situation, you know, obviously it hit home for a lot of people. Um, I think that, you know, this pandemic definitely uh, helped the cause in regards that, you know, everybody was kind of just sitting in one place and not doing anything and really able to pay attention to this. You know, my brother, Stephen Jackson, being that George, you know, was one of his best friends. I knew George Floyd personally as well. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, maybe, you know, times when I would go to Houston and different things like that, he would pick us up from the airport, you know, anything we needed while we were in town, he would run and go and get it for us. So he was an unbelievable human being and he did not deserve to be executed like that, you know, in the middle of the day, you know, with all these, with all those people watching. So I just felt like, you know, you know, I had a responsibility, you know what I'm saying, to, you know, obviously support Stephen Jackson, you know, and his endeavors, you know, in, in regards to, you know, trying to push equality, you know what I'm saying, and hold these, you know, these these officers accountable for, you know, what they're doing. Thanks, Al. So, so, so here's the the question that 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 I have for you and and Ben. Uh, and then I really want to give you all the room to ask questions of, uh, of each other. Um, you know, so the, the title of, uh, of this whole event is Reimagining Justice. Um, what does that look like for you all from, from where you sit, from your experiences? And, you know, what does justice have to have in it to really be meaningful? Uh, yeah. yeah, I can start, you know, so it's, it's a lot of different justices, you know, that black people need, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, obviously, when we think about just the systematic oppression and different things like that, that's something that has been going on now for 400 years, right? And, you know, obviously, there's no real quick fix here, right? But the good thing about it is like the awareness is being uh, put out there on, you know, on Front Street, where people are now having to have to deal with it. And, you know, that's the one thing that I wish more celebrities stepped up and, you know, had more uncomfortable uh, conversations because what we fail to realize is that, you know, we really make the economy go, you know, around not only in the United States, but around the country. You know what I'm saying? We are, it's because of us, things go viral, things become popular. You know, the things that, you know, we dominate is music, fashion, sports, all these different things. And the thing that sucks about it is a lot of those things that we're supporting and that, and that we're pushing in and creating all this mass opportunity, we don't own any of it. So, you know, you go to, you know, um, you know, something that I learned, you know, I think I learned maybe like my last year in the league, like what group economics really meant. You know, these are some of the things that, you know, black people have to practice because, you know, we, we, we control one point, you know, seven trillion dollars of money that's circulated throughout this country. And, and, and right now, when a black dollar comes into the community, it's gone within six hours. And you know, that that's that's a crime in itself, right? And that's something that I feel like we can control. But then also, you know, some of the things where, you know, where we need help and we just need opportunity, right? Is, you know, for black businesses. Because, you know, I feel like there's a lot of uh, of us entrepreneurs out here that are very smart, um, very creative. And, you know, if we could just, you know, find a way to get some, some more support. And I feel like we can be, um, we can set things up where we have, you know, um, not even reparations, but we can start to create generational wealth. Like I feel like every other race has really, you know, been able to establish. And, you know, that's where, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in economic empowerment. You know, that's my fight. You know what I mean? I, I mean, you know, Stax, I knew Stephen Jackson, you know, his fight is for, you know, the social injustices, you know, as far as with the police and different things like that. And one of the things I'm focusing on is the social, is the economic empowerment. Because I just feel like, you know, as long as we feel like, you know, bringing, giving a kid a meal or giving a kid a pair of shoes and thinking that's going to empower him to, you know, be successful one day, I think it's foolish. You know what I'm saying? We have to find ways to, you know, give these kids and give our communities opportunities to fish, you know, be able to create revenue, you know, for ourselves. And like I said, so that now we can start to rebuild our communities from within and start to have that foundation and that structure so that we can be, you know, just as powerful as some of these other races. Hey, Ben, your thoughts? Ben, I think you're muted. 
you know, we talk about reimagining justice. A lot of it is to just simply do the things that we know like work better. We have allowed the police to become the solution, not of last resort, but of first resort. So you think about schools, right? School discipline. We need smaller class sizes and we need more social workers. And we need to be uh, using um, restorative justice circles. People understand that they're part of a community. Community has expectations. You transgress those expectations, you're gonna need to make reparation uh, and you're welcome back into the circle. Uh, remember a friend, who was a school principal in Chicago. And he went to the uh, police chief and he said, you know, you're arresting too many of my kids. And the police chief came back and said, you know, I, I looked into it. Most of the arrests are not happening after school, they're happening during school hours. And his friend said, well, show me the schools. Schools where the kids are getting arrested most had the weakest principals, principals who couldn't manage the school well. And so, rather than firing a bad principal and getting a good principal, they were just arresting kids who were acting up when there's a lack of structure in the school. The, um, and so good principals goes on the list if you wanna you know, decrease unnecessary contact between police and kids. And by the way, we're, we're already paying for those principals. There's no more money in that. It's just good management. It's just high standards. We know from some of the most violent places, like you know, historically, like Queensbridge housing projects where Nas grew, uh, uh, grew up. Six years ago, uh, Queensbridge, like 20 other neighborhoods in New York City, got a big infusion of dollars into violence interrupters. We, we passed something, Steve, when you and I, last year at the NAACP called the Community Safety Act in, in New York. I was there that night at city council to like 2.30 in the morning to get that bill passed. And, Part of it was to outlaw racial profiling and part of it, you know, in, in the, the notorious stop and frisk program, and part of it was to shift resources. You know, so, so-called defunding the police shift resources that would have gone to more police on the street and is something that actually works better, which is to get men with the credibility, women with the credibility because they've come up on the streets, because they've been part of street organizations, you know, gangs. Um, employed by the city ultimately to stop the next killing from happening, to be on the scene when there's a fight happening, to be on the scene when somebody's just been shot, to be in the hospital room, having real hard conversations with their friends and their loved ones about why you can't retaliate, how we have to enter the cycle of violence, and then to be there every day, training people in boxing every day, you know, training people in de-escalation, literally engaging the culture of violence as it thrives in a community and reverse engineering it. And you've seen Queensbridge where there used to be dozens of homicides like clockwork every year, now go like a year and a half without a shooting, uh, like not even one. And, um, and so we've got to engage in the things that we, that we know work. We've got to take them beyond their pilot phase where they're and a half funded by charity and really scale them up and wire them into the budgets of cities and, and localities across the country. You know, I was watching a Michael Moore movie the other day with my kids called, Who Do We Invade Next? <laughs> and you know, he's, he's, he's kind of flip. And he was talking to uh, these European corrections officers about techniques they were using to rehabilitate violent offenders. And by the way, with violent offenders, what the sociologists know is that they're less likely to reoffend than nonviolent offenders. And so you actually have a bit of a head start there and there's a lot of work you can, you can do. And they're like, you know, where'd you get these cutting edge ideas? And they said, you know, from American practices in the early 1970s. And it's just a reminder that we've replaced a lot of stuff that worked better with a lot of stuff that works less well. The other thing I'd say, and it goes back to an earlier conversation about legalizing cannabis, mm -hmm. is that there are a lot of infractions on the books that don't make any sense. You know, the fines and fees got a lot of attention after Ferguson. 
there's a lot of other infractions. And if you go back into the history of the law, they were upgraded from misdemeanors to felonies because slavery ended, for instance, in Virginia, and they wanted to control the black male population. So they took crimes of poverty, like stealing a hog, and suddenly made it a felony, which, by the way, would also disqualify you from voting for the rest of your life. And so if you look at a state like Virginia, Roger, uh, Steve, you and I have a former colleague from the NAACP, his son's doing a lot of time. But what does it ultimately go back to? His the underlying felony was that he stole somebody's two-year-old pair of Jordans and the police officer valued them at $205. And the police officer knew exactly what they were doing. Part of the legacy uh, of those uh, post-slavery uh, sentencing enhancements and, and criminal code enhancements was that in Virginia, grand theft is anything over 200 bucks. So they priced somebody's two, two-year-old pair of sneakers for $205 so that this kid, who's was a teenager, would be charged with a felony, not a misdemeanor. Well, I mean, most states, it's over a thousand dollars. And so we've got to go back and we've got to look at the criminal code. And there are things that are felonies that really should be misdemeanors. There are things that are misdemeanors that should be infractions. And actually there's a whole bunch of misdemeanors and infractions, you know, things you can make a, a ticket for that shouldn't even be on the code at all. And for me, reimagining justice means at the end of the day, a much smaller criminal code and law enforcement that is there almost exclusively to deal with the most dangerous people in our society. Because the flip side is same communities that are terrorized by over-aggressive policing, frankly, are also terrorized by some over-aggressive, very violent people who seem to never quite get off the street as fast as they should. Um, and so we need to, you know, frankly, uh, you stop distracting police officers by making them be the social worker, well, then you can actually restrict them and focus them on solving unsolved homicides, which are way too high in our communities. Right. Thanks, Ben. Hey, Al, I, I want to give you the opportunity to ask uh, Ben a question um, from, from, from where he uh, sits. Um, you know, Ben runs an organization, People for the American Way, which focuses on liberty, free, free speech, uh, voting rights. Um, and, uh, you know, you and Ben have both uh, been businessmen. You are still are, Al. Um, but both of you all have certainly had experiences with the uh, justice system. So I um, want to give you all a chance to have a little free, free exchange uh, between yourselves. Yeah, Ben, how you doing, man? Good, um, brother. It's good to see good. you. Good. You know, one of my things is always, I always try to figure out like, um, it's just how do we get, how do we all get on the same page, right? Because when you think about like the project in Queensbridge in regards to, you know, them defunding the police and how, you know, you haven't had, you know, a, a murder or a shooting murder in over a year. Like, how do we translate that across the nation into all the other neighborhoods where they're dealing with like, like a place like Chicago? You know what I'm saying? Like, how do we how, how do we do that? You know what I'm saying? Like, what resources do we need? Like, who do we need at the table in order to do that? Because what I love about that is like we're saving our lives, right? So we're sitting. And yeah. I, and, you, know, you know, one of the issues I had, I'm like, you know, we're talking about, you know, obviously, you know, Black Lives Matter and different things like that, and we want the police to stop killing us, but we want to stop killing each other too, right? right. Right. And you know, one of the ways, like I said, the reason why I go to economic empowerment is because when I think about when I go to the neighborhoods and I talk to these kids, it's like, you know, I'm like, stop shooting, stop shooting, stop killing each other. And they looking at me like, well, what else you want me to do? What else can I do? You know what I'm saying? Like, right. Right. You know, give me give me something else that I can do. And then that's where, like, for me, I was just like, well, that's why, you know, we have to focus on creating opportunities to give these kids something else to do and right. occupy their mind besides being so frustrated living kind of in this little pit that they're in that they just, there's no way out of it. You know, there's just no way to see out of it. And, you know, I remember one time I had went to give turkeys away in Brooklyn, right by Dumbo. And, you know, gave them away at this high school and I'm sitting there talking to the kids and like one of them like had said something like he'd never been to Manhattan before. And like, we're underneath the Brooklyn Bridge. You know what I mean? I'm like, <laughs> you you've walk. never been to Manhattan? He's like, no, I've never. I said, you've never crossed that bridge. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm just trying to, you know, so that's one of my questions is just like, you know, how do we come together to uh, 
you know, to, to get on the same page and, and be able to change some of these things that we're trying to change. You know, what, what I'm focused on right now is like, how do we figure out what works and then get that replicated, right? To your point, right? Like if, if the violence interrupter movement is working in Chicago and it's working in New York, well, you know, how do we get it into Chester, Pennsylvania? How do we get it into, you know, Dayton, Ohio? How do we get into these like smaller places um, where there can be a lot of despair and a lot of violence and they're never going to, you know, rate in the top 20 cities in the country that people are talking about or paying attention to? People for the American Way, so we were founded 40 years ago by Congresswoman Barbara Jordan, Black Congresswoman from Texas, uh, and Norman Lear, who's a TV producer, created All in the Family, Good Times, Jefferson's, Facts of Life. The, um, to be a truly multiracial, intersectional civil rights, civil liberties group. And in recent years, the most important things that we've done is we organized 1,300 young elected officials. These are folks under 35, like 40% black, 68% of color, 30% LGBTQ, 60% women. I mean, they really look like the future of the country, right? Significant numbers of Native American. And they have power. They're on the city council, they're on the school board, they're, on, they're in the state legislature, they're mayors. Some of the mayors, man, are under 30 and were in NAACP Youth in College when I was national president, you know, like not that long ago. Uh, and now these babies have grown up and they're like 26 year old mayors, 27 year old mayors. And what you discover is that as much power as they have, there's no one really out there just focused on getting good ideas to them and people like them and exchanging them amongst them. And it really came up in this defund the police moment because, you know, like the moral center of defund the police is absolutely right. These are young people who are saying, like, WTF, we give you guys more money, you, you, you keep killing us for no reason. Like, it's just a bad investment. Right. At the same time, the practical uh, conversation is incomplete. You can't replace something with nothing. And frankly, you know, we got a lot of folks in West Baltimore who are concerned about home invasions, and you don't want to tell them that the police won't come when, when there's somebody breaking in the back window, right? Like, that's just a real thing. They just want the police to show up and work for them, and they don't want the police there for everything. They don't want the police enforcing anti-loitering ordinances and arresting, you know, four boys hanging out on the corner like they did under Martin O'Malley and giving them a rap sheet for simply being bored. So... What we've done is we got uh, our, we've trained people for the American Way, 42 of the young people who are leading Black Lives Matter movement in different cities around the country right now. We got them together with, the with some of the 1300 young elected officials to start talking about what they're seeing that actually works. And then, we're, then we backed them up with our policy department and even pro bono help from a law firm to scan what's really working the end result now that, that we're hoping to have by the end of the year is we want to be able to do this across multiple issues where you can get together, because we also have 3,000 Black pastors that we've organized, get together pastors, get together activists, get together elected officials, put the best ideas that are working in different communities on the table, and then provide model legislation so that folks can go back home. And if you're a legislator, pass it. And if you're an active or a if you're an activist or a pastor, and nobody from your community is at the table, give it to somebody who will pass it. Turns out that if you take power, but you don't have access to great ideas, not a whole lot changes. And we've got like, for instance, one young brother, um, mayor of Ithaca, New York, the last nine years, he became mayor at 24. Six years ago, he decided to change the practices of the local police department and how they use personality tests so that they would not just use personality tests in the traditional way, which is, can literally basically be like, can you handle shooting somebody? Right. <laughs> but rather use them in a way that would decrease the likelihood you would shoot somebody unnecessarily. Like, do you have the type of authoritarian personality that if somebody insults you, you might shoot them? Like real talk, brother at uh, 
John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York City, Phil Goff, will tell you when going through all the folks who have been shot by the police, the most common last word before a police officer shoots you is the epithet for a gay man that begins with F. You insult an officer's masculinity and you might, and, you, and, and that might be the most deadly thing you've ever done in your life. And of course, sticks and stones, like you sign up to carry a gun, you should be able to handle somebody mouthing off at you, you know, insulting right. your mother, whatever. So Savante puts these in place six years ago. In that time, 75% of the officers who, officers who in previous years would have been hired, they passed every other test, have failed the psychological exam because the psychological exam that they're using actually tests for the, for the type of psychology that leads to unnecessary violence. And what Philip Goff will tell you is that when it comes to being shot by the police, sure, it matters that the officer's racist. It actually though matters less than if they're authoritarian. You can have somebody who doesn't like black people, but it's kind of chill and will talk their way through a tense situation and isn't gonna get, you know, they're you know, all excited if, if somebody insults their mother. And then you have other folks, and, he, and he's tested plenty of live officers to approve this, who actually aren't racist at all. But man, you better do what they say or there will be consequences. And so we're dealing with something that we stereotype as racism uh, as far as officers killing people, but it's bigger than that. Because yeah, we are more likely to be shot than white guys, like a rate like three X more likely than white guys to be shot, but they're still shooting a lot of white guys. So you gotta ask yourself if they're shooting that many white guys, well, this ain't all about race. And it turns out it's about authoritarianism. So our hope is that at the end of the year, uh, we will, uh, but I'm, 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 it's day three of month two for me. Our plan is for the, at the end of the year, we will convene these 1300 legislators. We will bring the best ideas in public safety, in education, the environment, health, et cetera, and, um, and create a space for them to exchange ideas. The right's been doing it for a long time under the auspices of something called the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC. They have passed a whole bunch of bad ideas, including voter ID, into the hands of their uh, politicians who can push them at the local and state level. We've got to start doing the same thing. Because as you said, you know, it's like the ideas are there, man. Um, what's really painful is that they don't move through the ranks of our elected officials as fast or efficiently as they should, or through the, the ranks of our activists. Uh, or our pastors. And so that's what we're going to take on. Got it. We, we have a couple more minutes. Uh, you have a question for Al? I do, man. You know, look, you know, I'm, I'm still, I'm still building uh, high growth startups. Would love to hear sort of about your transition from being a pro athlete to being an, an entrepreneur, what was unexpected, what really gets you excited and what that you've learned, you think that young people who are feeling hopeless need to understand about their own opportunities to grow businesses? Yeah, you know what? Um, for me, you know, the, the biggest challenge, not a challenge, but uh, with business is just not realizing how hard it is, right? Yeah. How hard it is to be a successful entrepreneur, right? Um, you know, obviously in this era of us with instant gratification, that's not really business. Right. And any businesses or any business deals you get that somebody's going to tell you that you're going to, you know, give them ten dollars today and they're going to give you a million dollars next week. You need to run as fast as you can. Right. But, you know, for me as an entrepreneur, you know, my biggest challenges in the beginning was, you know, really just getting uh, investors to take me serious. Right. And take me serious just in regards that, you know, I didn't go to college. So I didn't have this big business degree. I didn't have all this experience like a lot of other people had. But what people didn't realize was that I had passion and drive, right? And for me, I was able to take, you know, my work ethic from the NBA or how I got to the NBA and how I survived 16 years and translate that into the business that I am in today and why I feel like I'm having a lot of the success and the reason why I'm so respected in the space. Because, you know, a little bit about my background, I didn't start playing basketball until I was a freshman in high school. Um, worked my behind off for three years, you know, ended up being the number one player in the country, being drafted into the NBA. 
And even when I got into the NBA, like to be all the way honest, I wasn't the most gifted athlete. I wasn't the best shooter. I wasn't any of that stuff. You know what I'm saying? But I worked my behind off that. I actually got to the point where I would say I won the top 150 players in the league for a 10 year span. And that's the reason why I was able to play for 16 years. And as I, you know, stopped playing basketball and put my entrepreneur uniform on, you know, I've kind of taken that same kind of approach. You know what I mean? I, I feel like at the end of the day, the only way I'm going to have success, I'm going to have to outwork people. You know, and you're going to have to, you know, and believe in yourself. And, you know, to your question about to, to the younger entrepreneurs is, you know, I tell people all the time, the reason why athletes or especially NBA players or any athlete that become professional, I say the reason why we have the success so we actually get to that level is because we don't have a real concept of real of reality, right? It's something about us that we feel like we're Superman. You know what I'm saying? And it's something about us that makes us feel like nothing can stop us. And you have to bring that into cannabis as well, excuse me, and, and into entrepreneurship as well. You know what I'm saying? And you have to believe in yourself more than anybody. You know what I'm saying? You can't expect someone to believe in you more than yourself because if that's the case, then, you know, I don't feel like you're going to have the success that you're actually looking for. So for me, it's always been about hard work and dedication, you know, putting my head down, continue to put one foot in front of the other, uh, no matter at what, at, at any cost. You know, you know, I got it. Definitely been, there's definitely been, um, you know, roadblocks that have come, you know, my way. There's times I've been very, very discouraged, but, you know, I think that my greatest attribute was that I just never quit. And I never stopped believing in myself. And I would definitely, you know, tell the youngsters out here that are trying to figure out what's next. And if they have an opportunity or if they have a business plan or if they have an idea, you know, push it to the max. Don't let nobody mm -hmm. tell you that it can't work, you know, because I definitely, you know, as I got into the cannabis space, um, you know, I had a lot of people telling me to stop doing it, don't do it, blah, 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 blah. But I realized my purpose in it and my purpose was about, you know, um, one, changing the stigma about the plant and creating opportunities for people of color who lives have been destroyed around cannabis because they use cannabis to, you know, uh, you know, destroy our neighborhoods at the end of the day. You know what I'm saying? They were very specific and targeted at the people that they, you know, arrested and that they held accountable, you know, for this plant. And now it's this new industry that's a billion dollar industry. And, you know, there's no participation from us, you know, and that's what I'm out here fighting for every day. And I'm trying to encourage as many um, young black entrepreneurs to look into this space because we're in the very beginning stages. You know, um, this, I feel like within the cannabis industry, generational wealth is, is, is attainable. And we're gonna have to come together in order to, to actually do it. Because once again, as I started earlier, you know, we influence culture. We make things hot. You know, you look at Louis Vuitton. Louis Vuitton was not going to say it was dead, but it was in the woods. And they bring Virgil on, who was from African descent and a black man. And look at what, how he's turned that brand around. They took Dapper Dan from Harlem. And Dapper Dan was popping 50 years ago. And they bring him on at Gucci. And now Gucci is now the relevant brand again. And then so on and so on. You think about music. You think about sports. So, you know, I just, you know, I just really like to harp on that and just try to encourage our people and empower our people to know our worth, you know, and let's just go out here and let's fight the good fight. Let's support each other. And like I said, just never quit, you know, just keep, just keep grinding. No, and it's also, it's, uh, you hey. know, what you're describing is grit and, uh, you know, grit and determination and not stop, you know, and not stopping uh, and making your own luck. You know, I don't think just, a, I don't think it's any, how do I say this? You know, I was sitting around an investment table a few years ago, and we kept uh, investing in uh, sisters and brothers who had these fancy degrees, like you're talking about, right? Like I do, like Steve does. And I turned my partners, and I was like, "Look, like we got to understand why Dr. Dre is the first black tech billionaire." <laughs> you know, like you know, talk about pattern recognition. Let's talk about that pattern for a second. Um, you know, our, one of our most successful companies was um, from a guy who used to be a cannabis entrepreneur when it was totally illegal. He had had a series of detailing shops, and then he bought a series of UPS shops for the sole purpose of the large scale illegal distri distribution of cannabis. And then he came out with an idea about how to make it cheaper for your loved ones to call home from prison. And it was specifically because of the grit that, that, that he had showed you know, in the street level economy, both legal and illegal, that we 
rightly believed that he could create a high growth tech company. And so, hey, um, you know, I think there's a lot of wisdom in, in what you were saying now. Sorry, Steve, I know we're probably- Oh, that's, that, that's all right. I uh, knew that we would need more time for this discussion. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing and hearing about how Viola Brands and People for the American Way work together on the issues that are pressing us uh, in, in this country. Uh, I really want to uh, show my deep appreciation for both of you all coming on today. And uh, these conversations will be continuing. Right. Thank you so much, Steve. Thanks, Ben. Nice to meet you, brother. All right. Great Take to meet care. you, brother. Appreciate right. you both. Peace. Thank you. Well, folks, we're turning now to the last panel of the day. Uh, for those of you who are tuning in at the end now, this has been Reimagining Justice, looking at race, cannabis, and policing. We've talked today so far about how policing has been criminalized and, the, and or, or, or rather how the war on drugs and cannab cannabis criminalization has worked to define the role of police. We've heard about how uh, cannabis has been weaponized uh, in, in communities of, of, of color and used against victims. Uh, we just heard, I think, a great conversation between Al Harrington and, and Ben Jealous. And now we're bringing in the last panel to talk about how do we reduce the harms that have been caused through legalization, through expungement, through dealing with collateral consequences and, and removing them as, as barriers. And also to talk about how we release folks who are still in prison for, for cannabis offenses. So let me introduce the uh, panel. Um, I'll start with, um, with Rachel Rollins, who I see has joined us. Um, Rachel is the Suffolk County district attorney in Massachusetts, which is Boston. She is not only the first woman to hold that position, but the first African-American woman of color to hold that position as a Massachusetts district attorney. Rachel has about 300 people under her employ, handles about 35,000 cases a year. And I'm sure I'm not giving doing justice to her full resume and background as, as an activist and look forward to hearing more. We're also joined today by Seth Rogan and, and Evan Goldberg. Um, we're not appearing on my screen. Oh, there, there, there you guys are, Seth and Evan. Seth and Evan um, are the um, principals behind Houseplant, which is a company that is uh, on the verge of doing great things and is committed to justice reform. And, um, and um, we'll hear, hear more. Um, most of you certainly know Seth from his movies and his background as both a, a screenwriter, an actor, a, di a, a director, um, and has also now stepped into co-founding Houseplant. Evan is also, an, as I understand, a screenwriter and film and television pr producer, and both have come into this space um, to join us today. Um, so I'm gonna kick it off. It's, uh, it is the, uh, oh, and Delman Coates, I am so sorry. Uh, Reverend Coates, you can tell us the end of the day now. Delman, are you with us? Oh yes, I see. So, Delman Coates is a um, minister here in the state of Maryland, has one of the largest African-American churches in the country um, and uh, has been active in the NAACP and civil rights for many years. So I am honored to have all of you on this panel. And Rachel, I wanna kick it off with, with you. Um, you know, Massachusetts has legalized cannabis now. Um, give us a sense of what is working in that space, but what are still the challenges as, as you see them? Sure, so first of all, thank you for having me. Um, we have legalized not only medicinal marijuana, but also recreational. 
Um, we are a state that with our cannabis um, commission, our CCC, we were really deliberate with respect to language regarding impacted communities, which is code word for black people, right? Um, because essentially uh, we recognize that the, the individuals that have been harmed by cannabis um, should be the ones that get to reap the benefit of this billion, and that is a billion with a B, dollar industry. Um, there are individuals that are still uh, branded with criminal records as a result of the war on drugs um, that overwhelmingly impacted poor and black uh, and brown communities. And so although we have good language, Stephen, um, implementation is the most important part, right? And unfortunately, if we look at Massachusetts uh, as a whole, um, there are, I think right now, 421 total approved cannabis licenses in Massachusetts and Suffolk County, which is Boston, Chelsea, Winthrop and Revere, where I'm the district attorney of, we only have 11 of those. And if I were to pull up a chart and show you where I think maybe the most marijuana arrests and charges had happened in all of our state, I think Boston would be one of those places. So what's important is we need representation, right? We need people on this Cannabis Control Commission that actually are from the communities that were impacted. We need a race-based equity lens that we're looking at things for. So I'm proud of the fact that our voters um, voted this in. You know, I, I was trying to sort of get up to speed. And when we see other places, for example, Illinois legalized, um, you know, through the legislature and, and the governor, we, we did this through a vote um, essentially referendum here in Massachusetts, but we have a lot more work to do. I think Boston, we were heralding two uh, wonderful men, but they are the first two black men to, I think, open up a, um, a, a dis dispensary in uh, Boston. And so if we're talking about impacted communities and who has bared the brunt of the harm when it came to marijuana and the criminal legal system, I don't think we have met any of um, the appropriately high standards um, that we have to require if we are going to remedy past harms. Hmm. And, and Rachel, as you talk about remedying past harms, I, I'd like you to share what you see as some of the challenges around something like expungement in, in a Massachusetts. Yeah, so Massachusetts, love, love my, my Commonwealth very, very much, but the way that the, the laws are written regarding expungement, the defendant or the individual that was harmed holds that right. I love seeing other of my colleagues around the country who are looking at, you know, on their own, just wiping out and expunging uh, people's criminal records. I don't like taking no for an answer. So even though I have great lawyers that are telling me, oh, we can't do that for them, they have to do it for themselves. What we can do, Stephen, is make it as humanly easy as possible for them to do it. We can find out who all the people are in Suffolk County, dating back to you know 11 BC or whatever the hell my office started, right? Going all the way back there to say, here are the 6,292 human mammals that were impacted by marijuana, right? Now, if you're Seth Rogen and you have a trafficking charge because you had an 18 wheeler with a hundred pounds of marijuana in it, all right, maybe we're gonna talk about you a little differently than Evan who was picked up in downtown Boston with two joints or a bong, right? And is now not able to um, potentially reap in the benefit of this very opportunity because he's branded with a criminal history, right? So, you know, I, I think what, what I want to make sure we're, we're doing is my office needs to be better at who are the people that were harmed, sending them all a letter and saying, here are the two forms you need to fill out if you want it expunged. And we will assent to those motions, meaning the very DA's office that prosecuted you five, 10, 15, 20 years ago, now with my name on it is saying, Your Honor, we assent to this motion. There's nothing for you to do, but you know, grant it. 
and then this individual can move forward. And remember, expungement, Stephen, is different than sealing your criminal record. And then I will move on. Expungement is as if it almost never occurred. Now, let's not lie to each other. We all know that law enforcement, we can still see some of that, but the rest of the world honestly can't. Sealing your record is very different because what it says is Rachel Rollins, one criminal record sealed. And they don't know whether that's, you know, 18 counts of some horrible, violent crime against humanity or, you know, a, a, an OUI, right? Or some other trespass or something else. So I'm, I'm talking expungement so people can honestly answer, no, I don't have a record and they can move on with their life. Thanks, Rachel. And hey, so that's a great segue for, I think, Seth and, and, and Evan. Um, Seth, I think Rachel, uh, you know, has a has a, a future in comedy as she was <laughs> drawing some of these connections. <laughs> but uh, but on a serious tip, um, Seth, can can you share with us, you know, the work that House Plan is doing to reverse some of the harms that have been caused in in cannabis criminalization? Definitely. Uh, thank you again for having me. Um, I think one of the main things we're doing is just trying to acknowledge reality and and speak to that as much as we can as people with loud voices in that the war on drugs was racist, is racist. The only reason cannabis is illegal is for racist reasons and we have to acknowledge that and and be aware of that and expungement to us is incredibly important because it is a, a step in correcting some of the wrongs and giving back some of the rights that these people who have been negatively affected by the war on drugs have had taken away from them for no reason so we've been working with you know uh, national expungement week um and we've been trying to raise awareness with them and encourage people to uh, work with them um, to get their records expunged. Um, we've talked to people who have had their records expunged and it can be a complicated process without an organization guiding you through it. There are lawyers who might try to rip you off and charge you for things. Um, and like Rachel was just saying, a lot of people are just unaware that it's even an option for them, which is a true travesty. You know, if, if your car has a problem, they call you and tell you, but if it turns out the thing that you have a criminal record for is no longer illegal slash should have probably never been illegal in the first place, no one, no one notifies you, um, which is just fundamentally wrong to us. So um, yeah, we're really trying to support the organizations and the causes and specifically, you know, the one that we've been working close with so far is, you know, Cage Free Cannabis and National Expungement Week to, to make this as easy a process as possible and to, because we really view it as correcting a wrong. It, the, it, these people should not have criminal records in the first place, it should not have been illegal in the first place, it needs to be fixed. And we could not understand more that we are approaching this from a very privileged place as white people in the cannabis industry. I personally have seen that my life has been far less negatively affected from outward cannabis use than many people that I'm friends with who are not white, you know? And so we, we also have that, that we are really trying to acknowledge and it just puts extra pressure on ourselves to really try to make good in this space and to not shy away from the uncomfortable conversations surrounding it and to really lean into the fact that, you know, we have not been negatively affected by a lot of this stuff and now we are trying to benefit from it and we have to reconcile that. Um, and expungement is a really good way to reconcile that and our support of it is something that we feel is again, a step in the right direction. And especially now, so many people are out of work, so many people can't get jobs because of these records and it, like never has it been more important to, to give people back the rights that they should never had taken from them. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think Seth, you, um, you know, Houseplant could have a partner probably with Rachel Rollins up in uh, Boston. So good, good to be connecting everyone. Yeah, that'd be so great. So Evan, um, hey, Evan, why is um, expungement important to you? Uh, I mean, personally, as Seth hinted at, like it just has never impacted my life or anyone very close to me. And as someone who is obviously benefiting from cannabis, with our company, like it just, it, it is, it is something that 
seems essential for someone as fortunate as myself and as Beth to, to put our best foot forward and help right some wrongs and work towards a better system and an industry that is in general socially responsible. And, and we also like are creating an industry here. And so we have a chance to kind of forge it the way we want. And, uh, and yeah, so we really just want to continue to support National Expungement Week and, and work yep. uh, however yep. we can towards helping receive donations and attending workshops and just helping create awareness for all of it. Yeah, and just to make the conversation a, a, a prevalent one, like if you are white people in the cannabis space, you should acknowledge the realities of the of the space you are entering and the conditions upon which this this industry was built and the history of of cannabis in america especially like a lot of people just don't want to acknowledge it or think about it and to us it, it's we we cannot operate one day without acknowledging it because we are benefiting from it and it did not negatively affect us and if and if i could Stephen, like so i was fortunate enough to go to buckingham brown and nichols which wherever you seth and, and evan and the reverend are from it's like you know whatever sort of wealthy independent school you have in your space and i used to say or now as da i say when we have our local you know, urban public schools that have metal detectors and police officers and school resource officers all over them. If I'm a class of 89 grad from high school, if there had been police officers pat frisking the Seths and the Evans every day that I went to high school with, you would both be arrested, right? But it's, but they aren't, right? And I like to say marijuana has been legal in the suburbs forever, right? Because police only arrest where they are. Right. And exactly. kids from the suburbs that I went to high school with smoked weed and hash and dipped and did all that other stuff um, when they went to their W towns like Winchester, Wellesley, Wabin, you know, all of our wealthy W towns. You weren't getting FIO'd and stopped by the police. They weren't grabbing your junk and making you pull your pants down and do other stuff like that that they do all over Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan. And not to mention, some of you were smoking in your homes. And we know that oftentimes, black and brown and poor people, our parents don't allow us to do that. So we're in our cars doing it, right? Or, or elsewhere. And that's where law enforcement gets involved, right? When we're seeing right now with um, operating under the influence, um, you know, what are they doing? How are they pulling people over? When we look at all of the racial bias that goes into some of these police stops of cars, you know, adding that on to the, the marijuana piece, it just exacerbates the problem. But I, I want to give real examples of the fact that, you know, if, if the police aren't present in places, arrests aren't being made. It's not because crimes aren't happening. It's just that police are flooded into other uh, neighborhoods. And honestly, guys, sometimes justifiably so, but it is just important for us to understand that distinction. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I'd like to get uh, Reverend Coates in, in, in this conversation. Um, picking up on that last point, I, I think, Delman, just uh, how, how on one hand, how, how the, you know, Black community looks at cannabis um, you know, and we've had some of that, some, some of that discussion earlier today. Um, Stigma is still around its use, um, how that, how that um, you know, plays out in, in, in terms of, uh, of how the community thinks about um, uh, the plant. Yet at the same time, we see people, you know, certainly I'm, I'm sure you have seen uh, among your church community, folks that have had cannabis convictions, um, the collateral consequences that flow out of that, not being able, you know, showing up on your record, affecting your chance for education, uh, employment, housing, and so forth. Um, if, I'm, if you could share share with us your, you know, sure. your 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 thoughts about that duality, right? Of of how cannabis detrimentally impacts folks within the community, yet at the same time, we grapple with the stigma around it. Right. Well, first, good afternoon, Stephen. It's so good to see you again, and a good afternoon to all of my co-panelists. I really want to pick up on something that Rachel said, namely that, you know, weed has been legal in the suburbs for a long time. That comment really conveys why I got into this space as a faith leader. 
because I saw firsthand the way in which young people, right, before graduating from high school here in Prince George's County, which is a predominantly African-American county, were, were graduating from high school with uh, a record for small amounts of marijuana, yet young people in Potomac, Maryland, uh, or Fairfax County, Virginia, you know, two of the you know, wealthiest counties in the country. Those young people were not graduating from high school and who were possessing marijuana at school. This, this inconsistency was deeply disturbing for me as a faith leader. We all know, as you mentioned, you know, the range of collateral consequences um, that cannabis uh, convictions have on people of color and Black communities in particular, the way in which it prevents people from finding employment, educational opportunities, et cetera. And yet, on the other hand, there is this sort of interesting um, stigma about marijuana in Black communities, oftentimes endorsed by faith communities, Black faith communities who, have, who tend to moralize about uh, marijuana in a certain way. And so I have found that I have wanted to change the narrative about uh, cannabis. Um, that, that since so many people rely on their faith leaders, I've really wanted to shift the narrative on this. And we've had some success in Maryland on other issues like marriage equality in which I was a leading voice in support of marriage equality. And so really for the last seven or eight years, I've really take a prom taken a prominent role in shifting the narrative around where African-American Black Baptist pastor, right? Um, who pastors a church of nine, 10,000 folks uh, stands on the question of legalization. I, I ran for Lieutenant Governor uh, with Heather Mazir with, on, a, on a platform uh, of legalization platform. I'm on the Cannabis Federation uh, task force, right, as a faith leader. I've had some wonderful interaction with Adam Vine and Cage Free Cannabis awesome discussions and collaborations with Adam and introducing him to other faith leaders around the country. And what I find is that there's a, major, there's a great deal of support for legalization in black churches when the issue is framed as a justice and anti-racist uh, issue. I think that's really key and important. The framing is so incredibly important because there might be a range of issues around the recreational aspect of cannabis, but people do not want their sons and daughters and grandchildren incarcerated, you know, for having, you know, small amounts of marijuana or for using marijuana recreationally. Um, and so I see there being a shift. At one time, I would say there was more support for decrim over legalization. And I see more and more people opening up in my opinion, in the Black church and among Black faith leaders around legalization. I think that's a great thing. Uh, I think it was seven or eight years ago, we were showing um, the house I live in, uh, which profiled the war on drugs, and we were instrumental in helping and getting many other faith leaders and Black churches watching that film. And as people began to really process and internalize the racist legacy and history of the war on drugs, they didn't want to participate in that legacy. And so in my mind, we need to ground our campaigns in education about this racist legacy as Seth uh, mentioned. And we need to really think about articulating the medical and health benefits because I think a lot of people tend to reduce cannabis to the psychotropic effects on the recreational side, but there are so many incredible medical and health benefits, Stephen, to cannabis, um, when one understands the, you know, the difference between CBD and THC, and I don't understand, you know, all of the implications, the powerful implications of that. But when you educate people about the medicinal effects, we look, we pray for people who are dealing with joint pain, uh, all kinds of issues. Um, and there's so many ways in which CBD can benefit uh, people in our community. And I think that if we talk more about the medicinal benefits of uh, CBD in particular, I think people begin to open up more to it. And certainly um, the economic benefits 
uh, are ones that we really have to talk about. It's part of my primary interest in being invited to be a part of the Cannabis Federation Task Force that we really have to figure out how to get more Black entrepreneurs in this space um, and, and, and in, in a range of uh, aspects of the industry. Um, and so I'm really excited about this opportunity. But for me, it's really important that faith leaders, and I hope I can communicate to faith leaders who might be listening, that we have to change the narrative about cannabis. Um, and really, let's not be hypocritical about it. You know, um, a lot of times, you know, many people in our communities, including clergy, are doing these things uh, in the privacy of their own homes. And so we just need to dispel these myths and really demythologize cannabis so that people don't have to live in fear, so that people don't have to have their lives ruined, and so that we can have a community of, uh, of opportunity. And uh, so I'm really you know, thankful to be in, uh, invited to be a part of this panel discussion, and I look forward to more work together to change the narrative on this issue. Thanks, Reverend. That's very, very, very powerful. And I'm shocked at the thought that clergy members might be engaging in the plan. <laughs> Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. <laughs> I, I want to re return to that conversation about stigma because it it um, it's it's part of I think the challenge that we have in this space, right? Is who is deemed to be a consumer of cannabis and and, and who is not. Uh, but Rachel, I I want to pose to to you this question and then whoever else wants to take a, take, take a poke at it. Um, you know, this whole discussion today has been framed around the role of policing. And if we see a day where there's legalization um, across the board and, and, and we're seeing results now, how once, once cannabis is legalized in a state, we're seeing real drops in arrest rates. Um, you don't see it as much with just decriminalization. Um, but part of what, part of my dream around this and, and you know, I wonder sometimes is it, is it just a dream, but can the legalization of cannabis um, change and begin to transform how policing takes place in communities of color? We know that cannabis in the first panel with Neil Franklin today, Neil was a major in the Baltimore State Police. You, 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 may, you may know him, Delman. Neil talked about how cannabis becomes the number one pretext for why police stop black and brown youth every, every single day. Imagine a time when that's no longer a pretext, the smell of smoke coming from a car. How could that begin to change policing um, or will something else just fill the void? And Rachel, I'd love to get your thoughts um, as a district attorney in this space. So I firmly believe that when you have bold district attorneys that say, I'm no longer prosecuting those crimes, that mm -hmm. police react appropriately. They buck, believe me. And when I won my, my race back in 2018 and took office in 2019, I made it very clear there are about 15 areas of crimes that I was no longer going to reflexively prosecute, right? That's what we do as DAs. We have one toolbox with one huge tool that says jail on it. And we use that tool for every single thing we do, right? From trespassing all the way up to homicides. Mm -hmm. And of course, do I think for homicides, we need that one big tool? Yes. But if you're telling me that 60% of the of the resources that I have in my office are spent on these low level, nonviolent, non-serious crimes, some of which involve alcohol and substances, right? Then I'm gonna wanna say, isn't it better instead of prosecuting them and sending them to the House of Corrections that we send them to a facility where they can get um, actual assistance, that we go to the root cause of their mental health issues or their substance use disorder. I will also add that I am a very, vocal and like blunt person that says with this war on drugs, which yes, marijuana is involved in it, but back in the day when it was crack cocaine and other things, nobody gave a, and I apologize, Reverend, shit about black and brown people that were high on those, you know, drugs. 
because they didn't look like the daughter or the niece or the cousin of a congressman or congresswoman or a governor or a mayor or a wealthy business person. And now when we come into 2018, 19, 20 with opioids and miraculously Seth and Evan could be the ones that are shuffling down a street um, high on something, right? And I'm not talking about marijuana, I'm talking about other drugs. Now we have this more compassionate, this isn't criminal behavior, this is a disease. It's always been a disease, right? So Stephen, sadly, I think there will, there will be some shift away from marijuana. And remember, in Massachusetts, we are a great case study where we have legalized medicinal and recreational marijuana, but we have a rec Republican US attorney who has said marijuana is still a federal crime. And that's why there were issues with the banking industry, with the FDIC banks saying, awesome, good luck with your industry. You can't use our banks because we don't know what the regulations are. That's why certain universities like Harvard, I could work at Harvard University. And even though in Massachusetts, I could you know, legally be able to recreational use marijuana, but I can't do it because at my university, they receive federal funding and I could lose my job there. So what I really want to make sure we're doing, Stephen, is we need to educate our communities because now we're saying, yay, weed is legal in Massachusetts, except we are seeing places like Colorado where five nanograms per milliliter of blood, you're found to be operating under the influence of marijuana, right? And, you know, Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, and Indianapolis have a zero tolerance policy. If you have any amount of THC in your blood, that's a problem. Whereas we all know in Massachusetts, if you're drinking, it's 0.08 with the breathalyzer. So I'm, I'm fearful of letting certain communities believe like we won, it's, it's legal. Because no, there are still so many hurdles that they have to get over as a result of a criminal legal system that is you know, setting itself up to, um, pull blacks over at such an, a, a higher rate than our white counterparts, um, even though we only make up, you know, less than 20% of the overall population, we're 70% of the motor vehicle stops in Boston, right? Okay. Are we that bad at driving or is there something else afoot, right? So what I'm proud of, Stephen, is with DAs like Kim Fox in Chicago, Marilyn Mosby right in Baltimore with the Reverend there, um, who have said, that's it. No, we're not prosecuting this. I'm using my limited resources to solve, for me, 1,367 unsolved homicides in Boston. Are you kidding me? If I have to ask, do I go to this family and say, we're gonna try to solve your loved one's murder from 18 years ago, as opposed to kicking a door down to arresting your nephew for some marijuana related crime? Of course I'm going with the homicide. Right. So that's the way we have to start thinking about it. But we need progressive DAs to be bold enough to stand up to the police and say, you can arrest them if you want. But when you bring them to court and ask me to stand up and prosecute them, the answer is going to be no. I think that type of bold leadership is going to result in a change by law enforcement. Got it. Steve. Got it. Stephen, if if I yes. may add something. Sure. Yes. Again, um, you know, one of the things that we, one of the challenges that we face legislatively in, in, in uh, states that are run by Democrats, but they may be more moderate, moderate Democrats or in red states. One of the challenges we face as it relates to the stigma is changing this notion among policymakers that cannabis is a gateway drug. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I found is that we need to equip advocates in the community to really dispel this mythology that um, many more conservative, moderate oriented policymakers have that, you know, legalizing cannabis in some way leads to a slippery slope. And the extent to which we can really equip and empower um, advocates and people in the community to really respond to this. I mean, it's it's a narrative that I experienced quite often, uh, you know, over the past five or six years in the state of Maryland. I know it's something that advocates encounter 
in more red states. Um, and even though Maryland is a solidly blue state, it's, you know, a lot more conservative, moderate conservative Democrats run Maryland. And this idea I find to be a major obstacle, this notion, false notion that cannabis is a gateway drug. And we really need to work around changing that narrative as well. Yeah. If, if anything, it becomes the gateway to into the criminal justice system, right? It's, it's the point where a lot of lives first get destroyed because of those collateral consequences that, that, that come into play. Um, but as we try to remove those collateral consequences, Seth, I'm, I'm curious as to, um, you know, how Houseplant has been doing some amazing things around expungement. Um, and, and this relates to one of the questions that we're getting from the audience at, at, as well. Um, what can other cannabis companies be doing, uh, you know, to address reforms? Um, how can they, you know, uh, replicate what House Plan is doing? Um, I think everyone has their own path, you know, and we are a specific case in a specific situation. And, um, you know, we can only hope to lead by example and to, um, again, like I have been shamed into <laughs> better behavior throughout my life. Um, it does work, you know, um, it is not, uh, you know, as I've been married a long time, so maybe that's something to do with it. But uh, it, I do think that actively telling people that they are not doing something in the right way is, is, is a path that, although uncomfortable, yields good results and it and it has with me and and that i think is one end of the spectrum of our approach and the other is to hope that just our behavior inspires you know especially other white people in the industry to acknowledge the environment that they are that they're entering you know and to what everyone is is saying like it, it, you know it, when you take something that almost everyone likes but you only make it illegal for the people you were trying to target, it, it becomes a very powerful tool. And, and I've, I've traveled the world, everyone likes smoking weed, but it, it you know, um, it, it crosses demographics and religions and jobs and, 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 but only a very narrow portion of the society is, 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 is arrested for it, you know? And so I think, and, and then these stigmas, um, like the Reverend was mentioning, I think are still so prevalent and as much as people can just try to dispel it and speak against it. And it's not a gateway drug. That's not true. It doesn't make you lazy. That's not true. Um, it, it, it has many therapeutic effects. I think doing whatever you can to actively dispel the myths and the lies that have been used to, um, again, just essentially to put black people in jail to feed America's <laughs> prison, you know, industrial <laughs> prison system um, is whatever we can do to just raise awareness of it, talk about it, make it a prevalent topic of conversation within the cannabis industry and hope that maybe another white person in the industry is watching us being like, oh, they, they seem to be very willing to acknowledge the privilege that they are receiving and and they seem to want to do something to reconcile that maybe I should do the same you know um that's that's a best case scenario that's what happens worst case scenario is I will physically have to shame people into trying to do better in their work as I hope more people try to shame me into doing better in my line of work because truthfully um it works honestly and people telling me I could do better has made me do better. So um, that's something that I very much carry with me and, and, and I'm open to, you know, and we could be doing better, you know? So like, I would not also say, look at us as the perfect example of, of what to do in this industry. I think we're, we're trying, but we could always be doing better, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm looking at, at some of the questions that have come through. One, one question that I'm seeing here is how can people help with marijuana can cannabis reform um you know from each of you you know each of you has a unique bad vantage point um you know someone uh, you know this is probably coming from a viewer who has been intrigued by the the topic is beginning to realize how criminalization of cannabis has been detrimental in in, in so many ways within communities of color um, 
what's our answer to them? How to how how to push for for reform? Reverend, your thoughts? Well, I, I think it's uh, first important for the person to be educated about the laws in your state. Um, every you know every state is different as it relates to legalization, decrim, uh, outright prohibition. And so I think the first step is to be educated about the laws in your state. And then I think the second thing is to get connected with an organization that's on the forefront of, uh, uh, of this movement uh, as it relates to, um, you know, uh, as, as it relates to legalization around the country. You, gotta, you have to get involved, um, uh, signing petitions, you know, it's it's laborious work, right? Like it's one thing for us to talk about this on a on a web on a web conference, but we have to actually hit the streets. Uh, we have been involved in um, you know sign, you have you know getting petitions signed, meeting with members of your state legislature. I think it starts with uh, educating yourself about the laws in your state and getting involved in a key advocacy organization. That's those are two things that I would say. Yeah, and I, I would just add to that that personally, I was obviously interested in all of this, but getting connected with cage free cannabis expanded my knowledge of what I could do and what I should do to a degree that I never could have accomplished alone. So just plugging into an organization that can help guide you really makes a difference. Yeah, and them connecting us with National Expungement Week and, uh, you know, realizing there were groups out there that were on the ground in these communities that could help guide us to use our support to help them rather than try to, you know, take over the process in some way or think we knew something that they didn't. It was more how do we plug into their systems that that are in communities and 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 help rather than you know everywhere is different so there we found that that was a good approach for us was you know smaller community organizations that we could help and when when you whoever that uh, person is that wrote in the question if there's a district attorney race that's happening our terms are four years um go to a forum ask a question or if there are no forums demand a forum have a group of you come up with whatever decisions you want to know what your DA stands for. They are the chief law enforcement officer in your community. Ask them. And as a former candidate, we show up everywhere we are asked to be. People overpromise, you know, and you hold them to that and consider whether the incumbent, if he or she is saying, I believe this is a gateway drug, we prosecute every crime that has to do with marijuana you know, maybe you're going to say, well, we're going to start organizing so that somebody else who's a little bit more um, progressive and thoughtful um, and in this century is is right to be the DA in this diff this county or somewhere else. Legislate members of the state legislature a little bit different because they they are required to know so much more than just DAs. We are all, you know, crime and punishment essentially, but you can ask anyone who's running for office to answer your questions and demand a forum. Um, and that's what I'd encourage you to do. Well, we're, we're closing out now and I wanna give folks on the panel an opportunity to offer any final comments. Um, I would just throw out National Expungement Week, September 19th, 26th, nationalexpungementweek.org. That's one of the main things we can say right here. Very good, Evan. Reverend Coates? Well, I would say for people of faith who believe in redemption, uh, we should be committed to uh, expungement and legalization from both a justice perspective, um, uh, from a medical perspective, but also from a theological perspective. We believe that people deserve a second chance and I believe that's why it's critically important for people of faith, for faith leaders to be involved in this movement as well. I would say, um, you know, I'm committed to looking at the racial disparities with respect to my office, the office I inherited and the charges that we move forward. I'm happy to say since I took over as DA, um, we have not, we have reduced prosecutions of any marijuana related crimes by almost 85% we are not doing. And the 15% left 
Um, I'm going to be, you know, thank you for putting me on this panel because I, I re required my team to look at our numbers. The racial disparities are still there. And I'm a black woman who's running this office. So to Seth and Evan's point, we can be shamed too, right? We have to look at where am I putting my resources? What am I doing? What I'm proud of is those 85% of those cases that we are no longer looking at. That breaks down to about 2,500 to 3,000 cases because each of our cases has about two or three charges per case. That is all resources and attention, I hope, focused on gun violence, you know, um, sexual assaults, homicides, things that we need to be focused on as opposed to, you know, things that have been legalized in our state um, that, you know, have wonderful results as opposed to violence and crime. So I'm committed to continue looking. I'm committed to helping Reverend. If there's anything we can do from Boston or Seth or Evan, we'd be honored to work with any of you. And Stephen, thank you for giving me the opportunity to learn from these people and to talk a little bit about this. Thank you, Rachel. Seth, you have the last word. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you again for having us. Um, I really think uh, I, a few things. If you are, you know, uh, simply put, if you're a white person in this industry, just <laughs> acknowledge reality, especially acknowledge the privilege that we've had throughout our lives and that we are, you know, entering a business that was essentially, you know, built on racism and that we need to understand that that is why cannabis is in the place it is today. It was to control uh, and target black people for the most part, you know? And so I think that can't be said enough. And the other thing that I will say is that consumers have power, you know, sorry, my phone's ringing. Um, and if, you know, hold the brands that if you buy cannabis, look into the brands you're buying from and see, make sure they, they meet your moral standards and that you feel that you are supporting brands and people that, that, that follow, you know, the, the things that you would hope to support. Um, so, you know, consumers really do control a lot within the legal cannabis space. So um, yeah, uh, I think make sure that you are, or try to make sure you're supporting companies that you believe in. Well, thank you all. This has been an incredible panel and I thank everybody for, for, for their time. And as we close today, um, I, I want to thank the audience out there for sticking with us. I know some of you may have come in at different points. Some of you may have been involved from the very beginning of the conversation. But today has been a discussion about how we reimagine justice, how cannabis, race, and policing intertwine and connect in this country. Uh, the, our program today will be on Facebook. It will be on uh, our YouTube channel. Um, I encourage everyone to post um, on hashtag reimagining justice and continuing this conversation. This is just the very start of what I hope will be a continued conversation about race, cannabis, and policing. Again, I'm Steve Hawkins, Executive Director of the Marijuana Policy Project. To learn more about Marijuana Policy Project, you can join our, uh, you, you can go to our website, mpp.org, uh, consider joining and becoming a member uh, and help us build a political movement that ultimately will end cannabis prohibition in the United States and help to transform policing as we do so. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks.